Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Council Rock School District Committee meeting for January 1st, 2021. If we could begin with introductions. Uh, Mr. Block, can I start with you? Andy Block, School Board. Denise Brooks, School Board. Joe Hidalgo, School Board. Robert Frazier, Superintendent. Ed Salomon, School Board. Mary McKee, School Board. And I believe we have some uh, School Board directors on the phone. School board. Taylor, school board. Mr. Tate, was that you? I believe we heard Mr. Tate is with us by phone, and is Mr. Bilek also on the phone? Mr. Bilek will join us in private. Mike is here. Did you hear me? Yes, thank you, Dr. Thorwood. And joining us is? This is myself. Yeah, Ed is here also. Great. Christine Taylor is on the phone as well. Thank you. And did I hear uh, Susan McCarthy is on the phone? Yes, um, Susan McCarthy is on the phone. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to hand this over now to Dr. Elliott. Thank you very much, Ms. McKee. Um, good evening, everyone. This evening for our Education Committee, we have two agenda items. The uh, first item will be a look at our um, district calendars, and then our second item will be an update of our elementary four-day um, learning option and our secondary five-day um, that is forthcoming. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Sanko. Thank you, Dr. Elliott. Um, in front of you tonight, you will see two school district calendars for the next two years, school year 21-22 and school year 22-23. As you know, it's our, uh, we aspire to get two years of calendars out in front of you. Our hope is that you see them tonight. We will um, post these tomorrow for the community to see. We will open up tomorrow the, the um, email address calendar at crsd.org so that our community can react to what they see here. Um, of note on calendar 21-22, November 4th, Diwali is, um, will be recognized as a holiday. Over the last two school years, uh, that holiday fell on a weekend and there was no school day off for that. So November 4th on the 21-22 calendar. Um, also, I'd like to point out that graduation has been slated for June 10th on the 21-22 calendar. On the 22-23 calendar, Diwali is slated for October 24th, and graduation is scheduled for June 9th. Of note, um, we are accustomed to having 10 weather days built into each of our calendars at the end of the year in the event we have weather-related school closures. Uh, you will notice on the 21 and 22 calendar that we have seven and eight days built in for weather-related closings rather than 10. And the reason and rationale behind that is we now have qualified after applying to PDE for what are called flexible instructional days. And I'll ask Dr. Elliott to speak to the flexible instructional days or FIDs as they're referred to. Thank you, Dr. Sanko. So in September of 2020, we applied and were approved by Pennsylvania Department of Education for flexible instructional days, which are days that school districts can use to um, hold school during what would normally have been a day that might be closed due to weather related issues. Um, when we submitted our application, we submitted it uh, for two years and it was approved for us to have five flexible instructional days in 2021, 2022, and five flexible instructional days in 2022 and 2023. Thank you. So back to the seven and eight respective days that we've built in on the, the uh, back end of the calendar. If we take those days in addition to the five uh, possible um, the FIDs, 
then ultimately we have more days built into the calendar that we have some flexibility with. Um, on this slide, you will see, as I mentioned previously, calendar at CRSD.org. That will be open tomorrow morning. The draft calendars of 21, 22, and 22, 23 will be posted tomorrow, and we're hoping for board action on February 4th regarding the calendars. Are there any questions related to the calendars? I have no questions, but I just want to say um, this is so counter to how it used to be like when my kids were in school. I love that we are approving calendars multiple years in advance, that we're locking in a graduation date in advance, because these are so important for families and planning, and hopefully we'll be able to travel, certainly for graduations. So I just want to uh, thank you. I think this is, this is great, and it, it's pretty straightforward since we're following the same formula, but... Um, for some people who have a history with the district, this is a new approach, and it's, it's really, really great for, for families. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from folks on the phone? And Mr. Bilek, I believe you joined us. Yep. Thank you. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. So on to our second agenda item for this evening is um, updating on our elementary four day and secondary five day. I want to explain first a little bit of the format for this evening that we're using. So we have six of our principals with us this evening who are going to be sharing information with you. Because of the uh, physical distancing and our health and safety plan, not all six of them are sitting here in the room with us uh, to start. So we're going to be doing some switching in and out of some folks. So to let you know who we have here this evening, right now in the room with us, we have Mrs. Nicole Crawford, who's principal at Goodnell Elementary School, and Mr. Sam Smith, who's principal at um, Rolling Hills Elementary School. They'll talk about the elementary four-day um, progress. After they speak, we will um, give opportunity for board members to ask questions before we make a switch to our next pair, which will be our middle school um, principals, uh, Mr. Tim Long from Newtown Middle School and Mr. Rich Hollihan from Holland Middle School. They will come in and share about the middle school um, preparations for the five-day um, forthcoming on February 1st. And following them, we have uh, Mr. Al Funk, uh, principal at Council Rock High School South. And we also have uh, Mrs. Ms. Susan McCarthy, uh, principal at Council Rock High School North, on the phone with us, and Mr. Uh, Jason Truskevich, uh, assistant principal at Council Rock High School North joining us in person as well and they'll speak to the high school preparations for the secondary five day and again we'll pause for questions after each one to start I'm going to share with you the updated numbers for third marking period we had a window for parents to be able to make changes to their um, registration or their option selection and that window closed today. So these numbers uh, that you see in front of you reflect the most recent data we have for the um, registration choices for students for five days or virtual at the elementary level. You see the data here by grade level. And to provide the board with just a little more context compared to the data that we had after the um, registration that happened prior to the winter holiday. Uh, each grade level that you see here increased by roughly 5% in the number of students who now are going to be um, attending four days at the elementary level. All grades except for second and fifth uh, increased by 5%. Second grade increased by 4% and fifth grade increased by 3%. This chart shows the numbers for the secondary level, again by grade level, and shows you uh, the most recent data that we have as of today, showing how many um, students have um, enrolled for five days in person and how many for virtual. To give you a little bit of context, these numbers are not um, significantly different than the numbers we had prior to the winter holiday. 7th and 8th grade went up by 1%. Um, ninth and 12th grade really had no change in um, the percentage of students. And 10th and 11th grade 
decreased by 1% as far as the number of students who have selected five days. Those are the most update numbers that we have at this time. So this evening, as Dr. Elliott indicated, we have some principals that have joined us and <clears throat> they're going to share with you some of the planning and preparation and particularly at the elementary level, the execution um, that has been taking place and that continues to take place uh, with the four day return of uh, students on Jan January 11th and the February 1st, 7 to 12th, five day return. So areas that you will hear about this evening from, from the principals will include student attendance, physical distancing, how we plan and what we're doing in terms of feeding our students, the arrival and departure, how we're addressing the needs of, of unique student populations, how we're working with after school activities, clubs, sports, and the like, and um, finally, substitutes and coverages. To kind of uh, to, to share with you some numbers um, as it relates to our elementary schools, the chart in front of you demonstrates each elementary school, each of our 10 elementary schools, and how many total regular education classrooms in those particular elementary schools. Based on the five-day registration data that Dr. Elliott referenced earlier, we are able to d discern that in Churchville Elementary, for example, we have 25 total homerooms, and based on the numbers that we have for our five-day enrollment, five of those 25 classrooms do not meet or reach six feet of physical distancing. And if you carry that thought out across that chart, you will see, for example, Wrightstown Elementary School, in the bottom right of that chart, Wrightstown Elementary School has 17 regular ed uh, education classrooms. Of those 17, based on the numbers that we have for, from our January 11th four-day return, five of those rooms do not achieve six feet of physical distance. So we wanted to give you um, a view across each of the 10 elementary schools as it relates to the six feet of physical distancing that we've all spent so much time working with. We've carried that out also to the secondary schools and the chart in front of you demonstrates Holland Middle School, Newtown Middle, Council Rock South and Council Rock North. Rather than looking at this chart like the elementary chart by way of homerooms, we're looking at this chart by way of the number of classes that each school offers. So if you were to look at Council Rock North, the total number of classes they offer are 514 classes. The total number of classes we offer at Council Rock South, 603 classes. Based on that um, five-day enrollment data that we have, those families who have said to us, we're sending our student back five days, we know that if 100% of those people come to school live and physically sit in the desk, that at Council Rock North, 133 of those classes will not achieve six feet of physical distance. We also know, again, based on the five-day enrollment data, that at 90% attendance, of those 514 classes, 97 classes at Council Rock North will not achieve six feet of physical distance. And we can carry that, we've carried that out across our four secondary schools just to illustrate for you what it looks like by class at the secondary level as it relates to the six feet of physical distance. We also felt important to share with you with the uh, February 1st five-day return to illustrate for you what contact tracing looks like. And um, just for the group, the terminology has changed somewhat. 
from contact tracing to case investigations. So we have been contact tracing, and you've heard that for quite some time in the work that Dr. Lambert and Dr. Black have been doing, along with the tireless work of the principals and the nurses. Um, we now are calling that, and the correct terminology is case investigations. So when we investigate a case in our schools, that means we have to investigate when a student or an adult is in the building and they are infectious. And we investigate that once there's an onset of symptoms and look at the preceding 48 hours. So by way of illustration, the, the graphic you have up there is an actual classroom that was set up at Newtown Middle School. Those desks are at five feet apart, center to center. And if one child or one adult, whoever it is, that blue number one, if we compromise the six feet of physical distance, we have to case investigate numbers two through eight. So in other words, in other words, if the blue number one is a student, we would have to, have to case investigate the student in front of and behind the blue number one, to the left of and to the right of blue number one, and diagonally in each direction of the blue number one. We also know that with our six feet of physical distance that we achieved in the hybrid model in our K-12 schools, that when we had to investigate cases when someone was infectious, that we did not have to investigate when we could ensure and our nurses could ensure um, that students and adults were not within that six feet of 15 or more minutes of an infectious uh, person. If I carry that a little bit further for you, just as an illustration, right now at the elementary school, our students, if we look at a fourth grade, a third grade, a regular education classroom, and we um, are less than six feet of physical distance, if one student is infectious, we know that we have to investigate that case similarly to what I've demonstrated up there for you with the blue number one and the red two through eight. And we know that that carries through for most of the day in most of our elementary classrooms because those students basically stay with their same cohort all day. If we take that same logic and apply it to the middle school and we use that number eight, we know that our students at the middle school rotate seven times throughout the day. And it could be that we would have the potential to have to investigate 56 cases off of one positive case, which would equate to more quarantining. And then again, if you apply that logic to the high school, our high school students have six periods. And if we take that same um, illustration picture that is up there, and we carry that out across our high school, we would potentially have 48 students or adults and or adults that we would have to investigate. Ultimately, um, if there's a, an infectious case leading to more quarantining. Now, mind you, these numbers that we're sharing with you are um, not completely 100% representative because if you go back to the elementary model, when students move from their fourth grade classroom, for example, into a music room or into an art room, they may be sit, sit, seated next to a different student, and then that could potentially increase the number of students that we would have to investigate. Finally, I'd like to share with you um, another example of how and why case investigations may increase. And we know, as I mentioned, there is an infectious period. So if someone is, is infected and they're in school, adult or child, um, we know that we have to do the case investigations. Currently, at our secondary schools with the rotating hybrid, students are either in school two days a week or three days a week. 
because we are doing cohort A, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, cohort B, Thursday, Friday, and then the following week, cohort A, Monday, Tuesday, cohort B, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Out of a seven-day calendar week, currently, our students are in school either two or three days that week. Um, that allows us to investigate and look at that 48 hour preceding time that someone is, is infectious. It really gives um, Dr. Lambert, Dr. Black, and our, our nurses and, and buildings the opportunity to track and investigate any of these positive cases. Just by comparison, if we have that same student or adult in an, uh, who is in the school building during the time that they're infected, and we are in school five days, our students and staff are in school five days, we now know that five out of seven calendar days during that week, there's a possibility of um, more people being in school at a higher probability of being infectious. So we share that with you to illustrate uh, the number of students with our return to the five-day week as well as our four-day return with elementary students and also to illustrate in numbers for you um, some of the logic behind what this case investigation looks like from a logistical and practical standpoint to our buildings. And with that, um, Dr. Elliott. So we will now uh, turn it over to uh, Mrs. Crawford and Mr. Smith to give us the um, update on the elementary four days a week. Great, thank you, Dr. Elliott, and good evening, everyone. I just want to begin by speaking on behalf of the elementary principal team and acknowledging the resiliency that we continue to see with our students every single day as we face these unchartered uh, waters each day. Also, we appreciate all of our hard work of our staff and our teachers and the ongoing support that our parents and community members continue to show and display every day. So thank you for that. I'm going to begin speaking about um, classroom setup. So at the start of our hybrid model, uh, on the 29th of September. Prior to that, principals, maintenance mechanics, and additional staff worked hard to make sure that we moved all furniture that was not necessary in classrooms out to another location in the building in order to allow as much space in classrooms as possible for students so that we can physically distance as much as possible. Uh, the furniture and the materials that we moved at the start of the year remains uh, in that, those storage areas in each building. And classrooms have been staged for six feet center to center where we can, where possible, where feasible. There are, as you know, as you saw, uh, some classrooms that we are not able to um, allow six feet of physical distance between students in all directions. But that, of course, is always the goal. Uh, we're working again as the numbers come in for our next beginning of the year, or beginning of the third marking period, numbers come in. We're preparing to again stage classrooms, seeing what we can do to make sure that students are as physically distanced as possible. Virtual Wednesdays, we are now taking advantage of the fact that we have all students on one platform for that day. So what that looks like for students, it's a great opportunity on these Wednesdays to be able to differentiate instruction for students. And that could look like, for example, using the breakout rooms that are available, say, for example, on Zoom. Many teachers are using Wednesdays to be able to have students work in small groups because they're unable to do that when students are in physically in the building because of social distancing. Um, we are also taking advantage of those Wednesdays to review data, plan interventions for students, and again, making sure that we're doing as much group work, small group work with students as possible. Another way we're using those Wednesdays, I know counselors are taking advantage of those opportunities where they can perhaps meet with a group of students that you can't typically do when students are in person, where you can have everyone on a Zoom call 
perhaps for a social group um, and and again taking advantage of those opportunities of having those students available on the one platform um, once a week for lunch we are all allowing six feet of distance between students because masks are off when students are eating obviously we all had to make uh, plans to ensure that the students are seated in spaces where they have at least six feet of distance between each student. Uh, in some cases, in many cases, there were lunch sessions where principals were unable to allow all students to be able to fit in the cafeteria at six feet between students. So alternative plans were developed and have been put in place. Some examples of those plans, uh, there are some schools that are accessing the hallway uh, directly outside of the cafeteria where desks are set up for students and the cafeteria staff, they're going out and monitoring um, throughout the period. There are other schools that are using the stage that is connected to their all-purpose room or cafeteria and using that space as well. Principals are continu continuing to work very closely together and sharing ideas and brainstorming ways to navigate some of these um, these issues and items that continue to come up, for example, with our additional students coming on the 1st of February, we're talking already, where will those additional students go when eating and making sure that they're all at least six feet socially distanced. Uh, I'm confident that we'll continue to find solutions to those problems, but that's an important um, item to point out that, again, students are always distanced when eating. And Mr. Smith is going to speak to SNAC, which is very similar. Thanks, Mrs. Crawford. So SNAC, is, SNAC and mask breaks are very similar, that we must ensure six feet uh, physical distancing at those times with the kids. And in some of our classes, that can be achieved in class. And when it can't be achieved in class, teachers have alternate plans. Um, some of those examples are uh, going outside for those times, scheduling those uh, snack and mass breaks outside, or when lunches are not in session, utilizing, utilizing the cafeteria during those times to ensure that six feet distancing. Um, since the beginning, our hallways have not changed much, that we are still working on physical distancing in the hallways with our distancing stickers and labels on the floor. And in some cases, uh, in some of our buildings, depending on the size of the hallway, we have uh, one way uh, hallways, traffic patterns in those areas. All of us had to really look at our arrival and dismissal procedures and, and alter plans for those. Um, more, more specifically, our car rider lines. Um, during this time, we have a lot more uh, families choosing to drop off and pick up uh, their kids at school. And because of that, we have a lot more traffic in, our, uh, in and around the school, in the parking lots, and on the roads leading into our schools. So we had to work with our, um, our staff, our local police departments and townships to, um, and transportation to look at ways that we can alter. And with, as numbers increase, um, and each time we have an enrollment period, we're constantly monitoring those periods and those times um, as we want to make arrival and dismissal as safe as possible for the kids. The principal team are constantly uh, collaborating and evaluating and updating procedures and talking about what's working in certain buildings, what's not, and moving from there. Um, we're updating procedures as needed. Just some examples of what we have changed from previous years. Uh, for example, our emergency drills. We are still very much doing emergency drills, but they're not done as a whole building. So for example, for fire drills, we're not sounding the alarm and having, in my case, you know, uh, say 500, 600 students leaving at once. Instead, they're being done by grade level or by class. And um, that has worked smoothly so far since, se since September when we began um, doing drills that way. Uh, another example, we have bathroom usage where we are limiting the amount of children that can be in a bathroom at once. That number that we decided was three. So teachers and staff are constantly reinforcing these procedures and reminding students of um, you know, what the expectation is in different areas of the building, distancing themselves from other students. And of course, again, the bathroom and other areas where we have to limit in small spaces the amount of children that can be in there. 
uh, signing students in and out of, of uh, each school. Again, that's had to change since previous years. We, most of us are using the vestibule as our main area for parents to sign their children in and out. It's also a great opportunity where we can have uh, a parent drop off a lunch, perhaps if their child left it at home, or if we uh, schedule a material pickup day, that's also done in the vestibule, where if we need our uh, at-home learners to be able to get some additional items or curriculum items, we leave that in the vestibule and parents pick them up. That's become the new normal and it runs smoothly in all of our buildings. We're constantly engaging our counselors and our core team members to monitor the social, academic, and emotional progress that our students are making. And so our core team consists of just some of the, the members, school psychologists, the principal, the nurse, literacy and math specialists, and we're constantly looking at how students are responding to the supports in place and what can we do to put additional support and, um, you know, support and enrichment in place reinforcement for those students so in every building those core team members are meeting and we want to make sure that we're doing everything possible to make sure that every student whether they are at, at home or in person that they that we're giving them the support they need and that they are progressing uh, core team they core team the process itself has been in place long before this year but that they are important and critical to making sure that we're doing everything possible to make our students as successful as possible during these unprecedented times our uh, school counselors have also had a wonderful impact uh, this year they're really trying to take advantage of whole group lessons where they're going in via zoom or in person to meet with students and to talk to them about coping strategies what do you do when you're feeling anxious how do you what can you do when you want to talk about feelings and you need some additional support they've really been uh, working hard to meet with students and again to impact as many students as possible and that's been done through their whole group lessons Finally, uh, digital citizenship. This is certainly something that we're continuing as a principal team and teachers and staff to reinforce with students. There was a video that was shared earlier this year with families in every community as well as staff where it just talked to students and, and addressed different ways to be a good uh, citizen when it comes to irresponsible when working online what does that look like what does that sound like teachers are constantly reinforcing um, the importance of being responsible when online and I'm really impressed our, our local police departments have also um, offered to be a resource in this area so for example some officers said if you want us to help provide this you know reinforcement and talk about the importance of being responsible online and and what to look out for uh and the importance of you know understanding a digital footprint all of that we're happy to help to partner with teachers to deliver that message so i know at good know we're starting to talk with um the staff about ways that we can address some of the problems that have happened online um and you know tapping into those local resources that are available and along with digital learning, we get our teachers continue to uh, work with students to become uh, uh, digital problem solvers. Um, we, we all have those that some things are sometimes things are out of our control. It happens at home, and then to be flexible, and then also have plans in place when the technology um, doesn't work or, or we have a problem. Um, we continue to work with our uh, technology department and our tech aides with uh, Chromebook issues or if uh, uh, there's a problem with a, a staff piece of technology, whether it's a, a smart board, a smart screen, a, a, a teacher laptop. Um, one of the biggest challenges our, our teachers are also uh, working to face, work together on with their students, parents, and as a team is balancing the needs of our in-person and our virtual students. Um, and and they're, they're working really hard to find ways for our virtual learners to feel connected to the classroom, to the culture of our schools. Um, and that looks different in every grade level across uh, and across our schools. Um, we, like Nicole and Mrs. Crawford talked about, working with our counselors and our core teams to meet the social and emotional needs of our students, whether they are virtual or in person. Um, 
teachers continue to get materials together, gather materials, have them in a place. A lot of times it's our lobbies and our vestibules for parents uh, to pick up materials for our virtual learners. Um, we also work with our counselors, our attendance sec secretary, and social workers when we are wor looking at uh, student attendance. Um, when we are looking at students, when we're balancing the needs of our students that are in person or virtual, that could change day to day, week to week, depending on um, a student staying home for various reasons. So teachers planning and, and always looking at that. Also, as enrollment changes and those changes with our classrooms change, the dynamics in the classroom are always changing. So we're always, as a school, reviewing our expectations, uh, reviewing our procedures, whether um, it's in the hallway, on the bus, car rider line, or in the classroom as well. Uh, we continue to work with human resources and ESS or subservice to fill uh, long-term, short-term, and, term and uh, daily absences. Um, we work on those. When we have an instance where we have an unfilled um, a teacher in the building, that it's all hands on deck across the board, the staff, uh, everybody's pitching in to um, meet the needs and, and just either supervise or, or to continue learning in that, in that classroom. Um, and then along with all of those items, we're continuing to plan for the third marking period, the, all the items that, that Mrs. Crawford and I talked about go into, we're always looking at our procedures, always revamping what can we do to get better as we as our enrollment increases in there so all those pieces that we need to do balancing the need of needs of all our kids while also being as safe as possible miss mckee are there any questions or um, board discussion for our elementary principals thank you for that presentation let's start with folks in the room and then i'll be sure to check in with colleagues on the line are there questions or comments mr block Thank you, Mr. McKee. Thanks for that presentation. Um, one, one question, I guess we're three weeks in for the most part now. Is there anything that you were apprehensive about with the return to four day, whether it be from a staff or student perspective, that you've been surprised that it didn't turn out to be an issue, or was there anything you were watch, watching out for that, uh, that didn't turn out to be as uh, big a deal as you thought it might be? I was a little nervous about there was there were quite a few students at good new who were incoming that had not been in the building since March it just so happened so I was a little bit nervous about how those students would adjust coming back into the building when they had been out for so many months but I credit the the staff the teachers everyone just rallies around uh, around these students and I was really surprised in, in a good way pleasantly surprised to see how well they adjusted to being back um, several of them I did see and, and speak you know to and they said oh, I was a little nervous leading up but I feel much better now so that was great I was I was a little worried about those that had not been back yet uh, this year and how they would adjust yeah and the, 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 similar to that is the same and, and just be, not being in school and then coming in and it looks totally different it, you know just either some of the procedures that we have and, and but the, the kids have been resilient and adapting to that that's great and then i guess maybe the flip side of that one of the things that concerns me uh about the move from the hybrid to, to more in school is those those kids or families that made the decision to go back to full virtual thus weren't getting that second day of school have you heard any residual um, feedback from those families one way or the other i i have not but we've had some do that but we have um, a lot of it had to do around the holidays with um, uh, being wanting to be with family or concerned about taking care of the family um, in there um, but not so much of feedback to when that, the change was made. I did not get much feedback from when that change was made. I have heard quite a bit of feedback from families that they really appreciate when Dr. Frazier shared that schools will continue to work with families. And there are some weeks where um, even though a, a, a parent may have signed their child up for four days, for whatever reason, the child attends two days that week. And, you know, they appreciate the flexibility and so far I feel like that piece has been really important uh, and parents have been very good at letting teachers know which was a concern are we going to know who's coming every day or not 
and I've been copied on many emails where families are saying, you know, I'm keeping my child home two days next week, here are the reasons, but they'll be in three, uh, or they'll be in the other two, um, and, and it's going to change, and we have to just continue to be flexible, and that's what families need, and we're here to support them, but I know that flexibility piece has really been well received by the community. So, so far, so good then? Good, well, just, to, you know, for me, and I'm sure others will echo the same, thank you for all the work that went into uh, doing what you've done from getting your staff ready, supporting your staff in that, continuing to support them as they teach to the classroom and the screen, and then also for supporting the community. I'm glad it's going well. Thank you. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. McKee. Thank you. Other questions, concerns? Ms. Brooks. I just want to say the sheer number of details that you have to think about to prep for that, I mean, and the same applies to the secondary level, is, is so huge. So thank you for being so thoughtful and thorough. I'm just curious, with the high number of uh, car riders, um, what is the situation on the buses? Are, we, are, we, are, are there any issues with crowded buses or anything like that? I can't tell. I mean, I, I can't go to school, but I do see a lot of cars, but I can't conceptualize what the buses look like. Just speaking with Rolling Hills, um, and I think we're in a spot where we have less buses, but our, our buses are, um, we personally do not have, uh, if, if we need to, it's two to a seat that we have. It, it's, it, the bus may be full, but it's not overcrowded. Uh, it's things that, it's not the way we've experienced in the past. Um, the kids are safely be able to a seat on the bus. I've not heard of any bus issues um, yet. I think our big focus at Goodno right now is more dismissal. We have more, obviously, more car riders than we have had ever. So, um, and that's just going to increase. So again, I, I appreciate the community. They've been extremely flexible. It's the staff, this is just what we're all doing, problem solving. So what the plan we start with, we're tweaking as we go, seeing what we need to do, and then as we prepare for the next wave of students to come in for in-person learning, it'll change again slightly. So everyone's been very flexible, but I would say a good no dismissals where we're focusing a lot of our attention right now because we're just trying to move those cars through 100 plus certain days as quickly as possible and efficiently and safely so but in terms of any kind of busing issues any feedback from parents or students or teachers I have not heard any that's great thank you Ms. Marcel thank you um, first I'd also just wanted to to thank uh, you for all of the work uh, every not every day but a few days during the week um, I drop my daughter off at school when I see all of the people that are involved with just there's so many aspects and details to this Brooks point and uh, I just wanted to thank you and I really appreciated the comment about finding solutions to challenges and I know that you guys are like adapting as you're doing it and so I just wanted to thank you because I know it's not easy and so I uh, wanted to start off with that uh, the question that I had um, is we've been getting some communications from people in the community about the virtual Wednesday and you know is there a certain point when we would move towards five days or not and um, you know in my experience with my kids they have a lot of you know they have a lot of time on Wednesday with their teacher even though technically it could be an asynchronous day and so you know I, I was just wondering if there is some type of um, just information you can share with the community about like how that works in terms of elementary students. I'm sure it depends on the teacher. Like there's so many factors, but maybe just explaining, you know, for that virtual Wednesday, maybe how you're seeing that across the school, how it's being done. Because I only see what you know what my children are going through on that day, as well as other folks. But I just thought it might be helpful for the public to just hear about what does that kind of traditionally look like. Thank you. So I can just reinforce that the main way that I know teachers are maximizing the virtual Wednesdays right now is through that differentiation with small groups. Because again, they're used to its best practices that you're teaching students at the elementary level in small groups at their instructional level, guided reading groups and such. 
right now with social distancing, you can't pull a group of students around a horseshoe table, you know, so they are taking advantage of those virtual Wednesdays to do the breakout rooms through Zoom. And having the, the children all on one platform is, I think, the best way that they can provide that type of instruction. So I would say if you're asking how we're currently using the virtual Wednesdays, that is really the main um, use of time is, is addressing those skills that are harder to do when we have in-person students and virtual students that teachers are juggling at once. Um, certainly, they're using the day for, for other, you know, tasks as well, like I spoke about earlier, looking at that intervention piece, meeting one-on-one -on -one with students while they're doing a, a class assignment. I think really what comes to mind for me is that differentiation of instruction. I don't know, Sam, if you want to Yeah, and it, it, it varies um, grade by grade. Um, and a lot of what Mrs. Crawford said, looking at that and then also teachers utilizing um, part of a lesson where it's a, it might be a short mini lesson but then they're able to provide that that uh, that differentiation um, breakout rooms where they can work together on that uh, piece of it especially when we utilize our counselors and our literacy specialists to um, help within that that differentiation as well um, but again mainly it, it does vary from teacher to teacher where some are, are um, using it more to, to reinforce concepts, to uh, reteach, pre-teach in some cases, um, to meet the needs of, uh, of the kids. Um, most importantly is, is at, at some point in the day, um, especially towards the end, since virtual Wednesday, Wednesdays do end a little bit early for the students, it's such an important time for our staff to be able to collaborate and plan that with all the um, all the accommodations, the procedures, new procedures that, that we've had to take place in the classroom, um, a lot of that, that team time, that collaboration time has, has gone away just for, for us to, what we're doing in school to, to keep the, themselves and, and the kids as safe as possible and meeting the needs of everybody, especially when you have everybody, when you have two groups of kids on two different platforms, a lot of my team time and collaboration goes away. So th th that time is very valuable to have too um, at, at the end of that day. Thank you, I appreciate that. And then I just had one more question. Uh, I know that my daughter has problems keeping her screen on when she's virtual. Um, and I just was wondering at your schools if you're seeing, you know, maybe that's getting better. If the students, um, if more students are attending, you know, four days are only virtual one day, or maybe it's too soon to tell, but I just didn't know if there were any trends that you've been seeing in terms of being able to, you know, have the faces obviously seen um, as opposed to just all of the little Council Rock logos um, for the teacher. The, the feedback I have that, that we've talked about and gotten it is, it definitely it helps is better when when the kid has their child has their screen on and the, the teacher can see they can see they're attending to see that they are um, um, whether the materials they're supposed to have in front of them what they have that they can visually see with that now there are different cases that that we work with different um, with different children you know there might be something going on different needs uh, um, an anxiety piece to that 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 is not. But that's constantly a discussion that we're having as a team, as a grade level, with our uh, with our counselors and our instructional support teacher as well um, to look at those needs. But we, the feedback that I've seen and constantly what we're talking about is we do see uh, a much higher level of attention when that screen is on and that that child's there in front of you. And families are working with us um, very often. Obviously, parents many in many cases they're working at home while their child's online that's just how the, what the reality is and how things have to be so in many cases when the teacher just simply calls the parent and says i've noticed that so and so has not had their their screen on it, it's you know there's a screensaver on the parent can very quickly redirect the student and say you know your, your teacher emailed me you need to make sure you have that screen on even though I'm in the, the other room and so a lot of those issues at, at Goodno have been addressed just by simply bringing it to the attention of the parent to reinforce at home not in all situations but a vast majority of them okay. thank you very much I appreciate mm -hmm. it Mr. Hidalgo thank you Ms. McKee thank you Mrs. Crawford and Mr. Smith for coming out here I think 
the one school I couldn't go to was Goodnow because I was there in the summer as the last, but it's nice to meet you, finally. Um, and I really appreciate the presentations tonight. Um, I guess when I, at the, towards the end of your, your presentation where you were talking about digital citizenship and you know technical problem solving, and you mentioned adapting, it's important because I think all of us have had to adapt extreme. And if I think about, we were just treading water at the end of last school year, and then September was like, whoa, remember? Mm -hmm. And now here we are in January, and we're, we're, we're doing, you know, a lot of people have adapted well. Um, and uh, especially the young kids that I see, I'm, I'm very impressed in, in my own house and maybe some others that I can see um, that are doing well. And then you have to think, well, you know, even in my, uh, in my field, some people you just can't work with online. You just can't, they don't have the capabilities or knowledge or whatever you want to call it to, to do it. So I'm thinking within the student population, we also have students who, who, who uh, may be, you know, struggling a little more and taking a little more time. And I'm wondering when we identify them, what kind of problems we're seeing and, and what we're doing to, uh, to help them along. Uh, from a digital standpoint, you know, because I know when uh, they're in school, they have a little more flexibility to help them. But virtually, I was wondering if you wanted to comment on it. I can speak to to one real critical piece that's helped with that is I've found that our support staff, they've been amazing uh, in terms of the support that they're providing to students and, and working hand in hand with teachers to problem solve. and. A great example, we had a student that was just really struggling online, uh, navigating the day, and uh, again, uh, just the, the situation, the child didn't have a lot of, um, which is very common right now, someone there to prompt all day. That's not what we want. We want to be able to you know, provide that support for our at-home learners to help give them the skills that they need to navigate the school day. So we tapped our uh, teacher assistant at that particular grade level and we said, you know, can you check in with the student at the beginning of the day and, and help him get set up? What materials does he need? Help him see where that's listed. You know, even though the teacher goes through this very often with students, that's, that particular child needed the one-on-one -on -one direction to help get him focused for the start of the day, get the materials out, and then she, it was as simple as saying, okay, I'm gonna check back with you in, um, at the end of math and then we're gonna look at the next part of the day. And after a certain amount of time, just with that instructional assistant working with that student, you know, we saw that he started to generalize those skills and was able to improve. So that's just one example, but we're always looking at how can we maximize the resources available in the building. The same thing has happened where we've asked our instructional support teacher to meet one-on-one -on -one or with a group to help build some of those skills. Um, the school counselor, all of the, the core team members that I spoke about earlier, they're great resources to our, to our teachers and to the students and families. So I think it's really important to use those resources to meet the children right where they are because we want them to build those skills. You know, education has changed, obviously, and, and we need to continue to equip them with the skills to navigate uh, digitally, you know, their, their education this year and beyond. So that's a goal and, it, and it's a great point. It's very necessary. So I don't know in your school uh, um, if you've had similar situations. I was going to, very similar, just use a lot, utilizing staff to, for explicit instruction in that area and, and you know, they're doing a check in, check out, um, and, and just teaching how to navigate that, you know, teaching and learning. Um, and, and how we can get better in different areas, and that, that's how we've helped kids in that. that thank, you. thank you. It reminds me of like a digital IEP, you know. <laughs> um, so thank you for that. I guess following up what she, um, Mrs. Marcel basically uh, mentioned the Wednesdays, and so I kind of had a couple different versions of what I've heard, and what I've experienced is uh, mostly synchronous Wednesdays. We've got very hardworking teachers. Uh, it's amazing to see what they do on the weekends, in the evenings, it doesn't stop. And uh, I think that's a reflection of most every uh, teacher out there, and it's, uh, it's great to see. So I was wondering if it was, an, it was optional on how the teachers had some flexibility on how they ran their Wednesdays on the elementary level, and maybe that's more of a, uh, you know, anybody can answer that. 
I don't know if you wanted to, Mrs. Uh, I think you spoke to it a little yeah, bit when earlier. We, when we started um, with our, our uh, virtual learning guidelines, um, we had a framework in there, and um, I think that was our, our, our starting point. And just like every teacher navigates and sets up their, their classroom, it, it, they mold it to them, their teaching style, and what they, how, how they want to run things, that we, we've kind of fostered that um, within, the, within that. Um, uh, each classroom, the teacher's kind of taking control and figuring out how, how they want to navigate that, that day, the best needs, the needs of their kids. And one Wednesday might look, you know, as much as we want to be consistent for teachers and kids and parents um, for that day to know what to expect, um, you know, the week might go a, a different way, and they, that, that Wednesday might have to be set up a different way to meet the needs of those kids. It, just like we would do in the classroom, we're kind of doing it um, with Wednesdays as well. Thank you, that makes sense. You, know, you want that flexibility for all those things you said you wanted to accomplish on those days. So I just wanted to double check on that. And I think I'll, I'll, I'll end with that for now. Thank you, Mrs. McKee. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Selman. Thank you, Mrs. McKee. Good evening, Mrs. Crawford, Mr. Good Smith. Good evening. Um, on behalf of Mr. Tate, who's on the phone, he asked me to relay that he has no questions and only his comments is thank you once again for the detailed and helpful presentation and for your continued extra efforts this year. Um, again, he's on the phone and he's taking care of his son. Um, I can honestly say nothing gets lost on me with what, what has been done this year um, in this district. Um, we may disagree on things about things, how things should be rolled out, not rolled out. Uh, but I don't think there's anybody that works for this district or supports this district that will never say that we're not putting a good foot effort forward um, for the kids, for the staff. And my thank yous to you guys, the principal team, the lower level, upper level, everybody that's a part of this, this Council Rock family has done a wonderful job. Um, that doesn't ever get lost on me. So thank you once again uh, for everything you've done this year. Uh, just a couple minor questions. One, how's the building, Mr. Smith? It's fantastic. <laughs> Very lucky. Thank you. It's beautiful as you come down the road with that beautiful sign outside. It is. Yep. Uh, yeah. It's it's great. Uh, great stuff. Great presentation. Uh, how are the kids? Tell me about the kids, what it was like when the doors opened last Monday. And for some of these kids, they haven't been in school since last March. For some of these kids, they've never been in our schools. Walk me through what it was like. For, for us, it was um, most of ours, except for our, a couple students, had been in hybrid, whether they were in cohort A, B, or C. Um, I think the biggest thing we saw was just the smiles eater that they were seeing each other again for the first time, in many cases, since last March. Um, so that many of, of our teachers and staff commented on that, that the kids were just thrilled to see each other um, in person. You know, they saw each other on screens, they saw it, but it was a different dynamic when they got to be together. Um, that was the biggest, the biggest thing that stood out for us. I'm always surprised when I go into the cafeteria, it's still, having worked in that building for 10 plus years, it still looks so different to me than what I'm used to seeing. And with the students out in the hallway, and you know, we talked we talked earlier about um, everyone in our in our council rock community. The the everyone has adapted and continues to pivot and and move forward. And you know, a great example of what seems so different and foreign to me, they adapt quite well. And I think it's similar to what you're saying that they instead of saying wow you're so far away oh we have these masks they're they're happy to see other other students and they i think i'm hoping that they all feel safe and that comes across just with their interactions um you know i think that's an important piece what seems really strange with having students seated outside of the cafeteria they see it as VIP seating. They're tickled pink. Everyone wants to get out in the hallway now. Mrs. McKee remembers what that, where I'm talking about. And, you know, so what you think is going to be difficult for children ends up being um, quite interesting. And that's certainly the kind of year we're having. And, uh, 
you know we just appreciate the again I have to say it again the support that families are showing us when when there is a day where a student's having a very difficult time for whatever reason since the four-day model began to you know they're communicating with teachers teachers are communicating with them <coughs> tapping the resources in the building we take it one day at a time so it's not to say it's without any problems any issues any challenges but we just take those one step at a time and and continue to, to problem solve with the resources we have available and you know we're lucky that we have quite a few resources so um, that's what that, that's what I'm seeing as well yeah and I and I've often said you know we have to learn how to manage the new life that we live in now and, and hearing that reassures me that you know some decisions even though they're tough for some people and easier for others that, that we're making an impact and, and Mrs. Marcel, Dr. Thor and I toured south and in, in Holland Middle last week and I know he's in the green room probably but he's getting ready to come in here but Rich Holleran said, uh, Mr. Holleran said that we asked about the, the, if, if the kids have lost anything in the education world and he said you know it was a great it was a great story that he said he said they, if they did you know what they learned they learned how to be patient they learned how to troubleshoot you learned how to work through things. And you think about that, and like, you know, I guess we're all relatively the same age, and to some degree. We did that. You know, giving the kids and making these kids and forcing these kids, I guess you could say, into doing that, that could probably come back and make them the strongest generation ever by these things. They're going through a situation that none of us have ever gone through. And they're doing pretty good. I mean, our kids are coming through this. And, and it's with your, with your help that they're doing it. You're writing the history books for Council Rock. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Thorwood, I'm going to start with you and then go to Mr. Bialik. Have you any questions or comments? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? I'll go first. Yes, please go ahead. Um, I've got, okay, thanks. Um, I guess I've got more of a philosophical question than an actual question. And, and, and maybe you can answer, maybe you can as principals, but, you know, I, I heard the virtues of this virtual Wednesday, but I'm haunted by, I guess it was Mark Klein who said, the best education happens when a qualified teacher's in front of kids. And this seems to, I don't know, take away from a qualified teacher being in front of kids, I guess in a group setting. So, my, that's one half of it. I'm also haunted by the fact that, um, you know, while we're not a daycare, parents have to work and build careers and lives around school being open five days a week. Um, businesses have sprung out throughout the area to provide before and after school care for kids five days a week. But that dangling Wednesday is, is really tough for the parents that don't work from home in our community, and there's a lot of them. So I, I guess philosophically, my question is, when did it end? When are we going to go, when are we going to trip that switch? We've only been back for a couple of weeks, but I, I think we can't lose sight of the fact that at some point it has to end too. So I, I, I'd like your opinions on that. Uh, I, I'm assuming you agree that at some point we've got to flip that switch, but uh, any comments, if you don't have any, that's fine too. Thanks. I think Dr. Thorward, this is Dr. Frazier, I'll, I'll take that off of the principal's plates. Um, because it's probably a little bit more appropriate for myself, Dr. Elliot, or Dr. Sanko to speak to that. And, and as you said, you know, we, we're, we're new into this model, um, only, only a few days in. I think it's uh, too soon for us to know. I, I'm really pleased with what I'm seeing uh, and hearing about these Wednesdays and pleased with what I've heard uh, here this evening as well. Um, and certainly we got um, you know some factors that are tugging on it as, as you've referenced there's certainly no doubt about that but um, as I sit here this evening um, you know what are we 11 days in 10 days or 11 days in um, to this model I think it's a little bit too soon uh, for us to, to know when the right time might be to, uh, to pivot but um, like I said, I'm, I certainly understand what uh, what those issues and concerns are, and also understand that the model is really, um, you know, has been really effective uh, so far, and uh, paying a lot of dividends for for a lot of kids and and staff as well. But first and foremost, uh, the kids. Dr. Thorward, do you have any other additional comments or questions? So 
sorry, I was muted. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I'm fine. I, I, I'm going to, this will be a, a continuing question. I, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the answer I got. I, I just, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm looking ahead. That's all. Um, I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for sharing your thoughts. Uh, Mr. Bailick, questions or comments? I have no questions and no additional comments. Uh, I appreciate all the comments from the board members and the updates from the staff members. Appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hidalgo, back to you. Thank you, Ms. McKee. Um, I, I'll be brief, but I was kind of excited when I heard about the VIP seating. Mrs. Crawford, that, that to me was something that when we were trying to solve, problem solve for the high school lunches, I thought utilizing the hallways during that time would be something um, looking into. So I just wanted to ask real quickly, what does that look like uh, in the elementary school about how many students? I'm sure they're spaced six feet apart. Maybe they're single desks mm -hmm. and they're, they're premium seating, as you said, because some people just want, you know, to have that special environment and have that break maybe uh, for the time that they're in lunch. So I'd be really interested just to hear what that looks like. And we're doing it because we need the space, right? Sure, so. absolutely. So in the, in the cafeteria, in order to um, allow for six feet in between every student, <clears throat> we found that three grade levels at Goodnow had an overflow. We were not able to fit for the one grade level, the highest was 14 students. And I just want to highlight again, I can't say it enough, the amount of teamwork that we're all experiencing in, in each of our buildings. And I remember our, our maintenance mechanics have really been a, a critical piece in just all the, the staging, the planning, the actual uh, movement of furniture and such. And I remember talking with the maintenance mechanic at my building and I said, gee, we need at least for, you know, space for 14 more students. And we started to think of all these different ideas and required a lot. And it, it was actually him that said, well, this, why, why not right here, you know? And, and it, was a, it was a great idea. So I called the fire department, we um, consulted with them, made sure that there were no fire code issues, you know, just checked off some of those boxes to make sure that it was appropriate. And once that they gave their blessing that we could use that space, it's just um, single desks aligning the hallway immediately outside the cafeteria. And what makes it a good plan is, it's very easy for supervision to continue. So you have your cafeteria monitors who are based in the cafeteria and they're going out um, to the hallway to check, let them know when snack is happening. And that's a lot more efficient and, and it makes a lot more sense than to then have it broken up between some in the cafeteria and some in the classrooms, which was a scenario that we had to consider at one point. So it's worked out well these last three weeks. We certainly have to go back, look at our numbers once they're finalized for the uh, start of third marking period, but we'll be maximizing that space in the hallway again. And I think it's all how you present it to students. Wow, look, look at this. This has never happened ever at Goodno. Oh, we want to be a part of that. Can we have that desk? So, you know, they're seated and, um, you know, they're, they're not supposed to be turning around and talking close. Like, they know what they can do, but they're still just happy to be out there. So it's just, and we'll have to, you know, modify it a bit when we have more students coming in, but that's the plan right now. Well, thank you. Sounds like a great solution. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it, both of you. Great. Well, finally, I just also want to share my sincere thanks. Um, we know that whatever success we do experience, it doesn't happen by accident. And clearly, you, everyone in your buildings has worked so hard. Uh, kids, families have worked so hard to bring us some success here and get kids back in school learning happily. So um, I just really want to share my, my appreciation and ask that you pass that on to your buildings. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think back to you, Dr. Elliott. Uh, thank you, Ms. McKee. So thank you very much, Mr. Smith and, and Mrs. Crawford, for your time this evening. I know having been in your buildings all day long with students and, and being here tonight, we really appreciate your time. So we're going to take just a few uh, seconds to do some transition to our next pair of principals. So give us just a, a few seconds to do that. Mrs. Crawford, Mr. Smith, good job. Thank you.
Our two middle school principals to talk about uh, the planning that they've been doing and preparing for our move to five days. So we have Mr. Rich Hollihan from Holland Middle School and Mr. Tim Long from Newtown Middle School. So much of this for us is already in practice, but there are some things that we will need to adjust as we look for a larger influx of kids. Right now, um, we are running somewhere in the neighborhood of 360 to 370 kids on a hybrid day uh, with our with our five-day kids those numbers can fluctuate a little bit um, but as we move into the next phase and with the most recent registration numbers we'll see that number jump fairly significantly and it looks to be somewhere as you saw earlier in the neighborhood of 75 78 percent of our kids are looking to come back and so when it comes to the arrival and departure procedures, those things that we have set in place now should function fairly well uh, because the spaces that we identified as kids come into the building are large enough to manage those populations. And so we're not looking at drastic changes to those things. Um, our, our student driving population now uh, is, is in the building in very efficient times. We haven't seen any students being uh, coming in the building late because of traffic issues and so if we look to managing uh, doubling the population even I don't see that there'll be a problem with the number of stacking the, the number of car stacking that we have on our parking areas uh, but we do have amends for that because we've seen those kinds of influxes in the past when you get rainy days uh, or certain days of the week when we have larger traffic issues uh, we get a little bit of assistance from our security officer and some help in the parking lot. So we're, we're comfortable and um, confident that we can bring kids into the building and exit kids out of the building in a, in a, in a fair amount of time and with uh, a decent amount of space. Our cafeteria is somewhat limited because our buses come in from one side of the building and the car riders come in from the other. And so what we've been doing over time is trafficking kids into the building by team and so if you're on the C team, you, you go to the cafeteria. If you're on the B team, you go to the gymnasium. If you're on the A team, you go to the auditorium. Uh, but we don't see any significant issues in um, having those arrival and departure problems. I think that would be a fairly smooth transition for us. Um, in, in terms of our physical distancing, I think, um, as Mr. Sanko shared with you, our numbers coming up, um, we, we will have a difficult time maintaining six feet of dis distance in a fair number of our classes. And so as we get those final numbers and begin to look at classroom seating charts uh, and, and putting those numbers of desks back in the room, we'll get a better sense of what that's going to look like uh, in a practical view. And so um, that will become a bit problematic for us in maintaining that six feet of physical distance. Um, Tim will expand a little bit on, on the, the case investigations and, and managing other spaces in the building that we have available when um, other teachers are on uh, prep periods and so how, we, how can we space kids out during you know, snack and, and fueling times for kids. So the, the, for case investigations and physical distancing, uh, Dr. Sanko did kind of go over some of the, the complicating factors. Um, the biggest piece of that really kind of helps, and I think the picture that he showed earlier kind of says it all, we need, we're, we're preparing right now as we speak for what is the potential total number of kids that will be seated in a specific class at any given time. So we're looking at uh, classroom numbers right now of you know, 24, 26, but we're also putting one or two additional desks or chairs in there just in, in the event that the number and the data that we have is off and in the event that on any given day all students arrive and so in preparing for that you get that the rows and lined up line uh, lined rows which takes our desk that we currently have from the um, six feet to the five or four feet of distancing in between the two so in even if i have a class of 26 and only 20 kids show up or even 17 students show up it still be, will be complicated to so, uh, physical distance those kids because the classroom is already established. It's not, it's not that we can move furniture out of the way, set a class. So that will be um, 
a challenge, but I think um, it's we're ready for it. We've, we've started the process of moving chairs um, and, and preparing for kids to be in our building. Um, as Rich said, we have um, ha have systems in place for arrival and for departure. Um, knowing we have middle school kids and middle school kids, much like elementary kids, like to kind of sometimes jump on each other's backs. I mean, they haven't seen each other in a while, so there's, there's some of that angst, but we're ready for them. We have good uh, procedures in place, the one-way trafficking in the building. Um, as, and what you hear a lot of, from us is very similar. We're very fortunate that we, you know, we work closely and our buildings are very similar. So a lot of the procedures and policies and things we put in place are the same. So we'll continue with the one-way traffic. Uh, we'll continue with the, the backpack use and not really getting into lockers because it allows for even flow and steady flow in our, in our, in our hallways. And um, so there's a lot of things that we have, we're set and we're ready for. And, you know, basically comes down to give us a direction and, and we're willing to move forward and follow that. So on the same vein of that uh, physical distancing, we know that on any given day, we may not have the population that we're expecting or the numbers are telling us. And so in conversations with our teacher leadership groups uh, and, and some of the teachers that we you know, have frequent dialogue with, do we then take a classroom and physically distance it if we're capable if, if we're capable of doing that and the answer is obviously yes we would like to do that so if in fact we have a class of 24 kids and only 16 of them show up we know at that point we can physically distance them the difficult piece of that will be does the seating arrangement with with the maximum number of capacity seats for that particular course allow for that distancing the other complicating factor to that is then the teacher will need to take his or her current seating chart that we use for, for contact tracing um, or the case investigations, now we need to take a snapshot of what that classroom looks like so we know who was sitting where. If we are able to distance those students at six feet, we will make those accommodations and then um, we're exploring ways of coming up with alternate seating charts so that we know on any given day we're able to tell where students sat even though we may have moved them off of the normal seating chart because we were able to physically distance them. So those are the kind of dial that's the kind of dialogue we're having with teachers now uh, and, and some of the unknowns that we that we face as we look forward to the February 1st um, date uh, and that's the, that's what we're focusing our attention now is, is how how are we going to overcome the challenges how are we going to to um, make amends for the things that we can to keep kids as safe as, safe as we can. The student uh, impact and planning on, on attendance, again, we, we've taken some uh, formal and informal data on the numbers of kids that are expected to be in school versus the number of kids that are actually in school. Uh, if you ask the math teachers, they'll tell you the day that I give a test, many of my kids stay home. Uh, although that's a nice piece of information, it's not something that we can uh, predict. And, and so we're not exactly sure what those numbers are going to look like. We're, we're personally hopeful that as many kids that can attend will, because it's important for kids to be in school. But we also know that it's important for parents and community members who may be concerned about the number of kids in class. And so when it comes to planning, we have to plan for the maximum number of students that will be in any one class. And that for, for a teacher may be only one section. So their room needs to be set up to accommodate that one section even though the other four sections of the classes may be smaller. Um, with regard to the teacher planning for content and for the asynchronous time at the end of the school day, um, if you've seen the model that we've developed for the period rotation and the time per class is we've only shaved a couple of minutes off of each class. Right now they sit at 41 minutes, normally they're at 44. And so we've removed some time from the passing as well as the, the classroom time to accommodate for the middle of the day snack period, but at the end of the day that, that amounts to about 21 minutes of lost instructional time for a kid across those seven classes. And so the asynchronous learning we're looking at now is how do we uh, how do we spread that out over time so it's not confusing to kids? How do we communicate to teachers what exactly we're expected or expecting during that asynchronous time, knowing that kids are going to be traveling home either by car or on the bus, returning from home, 
and then facing this additional asynchronous work. So part of our dialogue now is what does that look like? When is it given? Are we doing math on Mondays, social studies and science on Tuesdays? Uh, and so we're trying to map that out so that it makes the most sense for kids and, and, for, and for teachers and also um, dialogue with regard to what does that look like for kids at the end of the day? What does that asynchronous piece look like? Uh, and not providing additional um, overbearing expectations now that they're home from school uh, and, and having to add to their workload. And so we're in the process of, of sort of hammering out those details uh, in the anticipation for February 1st. So that, um, as you are aware, uh, the middle school and the high schools will be moving to an early release um, schedule. And that was decided uh, based on the ability to manage the number of kids we need to manage and allow them to eat in a safe distance. And so our schedule, inside our schedule, the middle level, it has a built-in snack time to it. Um, that will allow kids to take the time to eat. It is a 15 minute, 10 to 15 minute block. And you may ask yourself, well, if you can have time for them to eat a snack, why can't you have time to have them have lunch? And it really comes down to numbers. It's a numbers game and it's, a, it's our ability to staff and support those kids in those environments. So when we're providing the snack time for kids, which is gonna occur around 10.54 in the morning, um, it's gonna be an opportunity for all staff to be hands on deck. We're gonna utilize classrooms, separate them out. We're gonna utilize spaces in our hallways, separate them out. Utilize our cafeteria as it exists. We have 123 seats in there. Allow kids to go down there. So we'll be able to create that six feet of separation, which will allow kids to safely take off their masks and have a snack. Now, we use the word snack, um, and I wanna just caution people, snack time during this time, don't think in pretzels or chips. A middle school kid can pound a lot of food in a short amount of time. So allow them to bring their, whatever they need for that time. They're gonna have 15 minutes. So they can have their bottle of water, they may have a sandwich. And I will tell you that Chartwells will be providing us um, with lunches. So as kids enter the building, those who want a, sn a snack and a lunch or a breakfast item and a lunch, they'll be have that opportunity to pick that up as they're entering, entering the building. And we decided that was our best time because it provided the most opportunity as you know, we had that RA time in the morning, so nothing gets backed up. Instead of trying to really get all this stuff out to kids as they're going to the buses, which would clog things up, we have a more relaxed entry point. Kids coming in, not all at once, but in waves, which allows us to better manage the distribution of those things. So we have it set up, we have a, we have a plan in place to help accommodate these kids. And we, you know, some, at some point in time, we were talking about well, what is the length? Well, if you know a middle school child, they, they need frequent breaks and opportunities. So this 15 minutes will be that opportunity for them to kind of reset, refocus, and finish the day in a strong way with having some food in their system. So they're not gonna go hungry. But again, I would caution, snack doesn't mean pretzels. It means whatever your child can eat during that time, allow them to bring that and have that. And we'll be also providing those things as well. And as Tim mentioned, on the way into the building, Chartwells is providing lunch and a breakfast for each child. And so they will have uh, access to those things during that, that time in the morning. So one of, the, one of the benefits of being in a middle school is that the district has afforded us the opportunity to be teamed. And so when we have teams, teachers have common planning time, uh, and, and common team time. So one of the things that we've noticed over time is that those teams develop an identity and we really, they turn more into a family because they're sharing lunch together, they share, share social times together, they share dialogue about their kids together and they share personal uh, interactions with each other. And so they develop the sense of a bond that I think we, we don't give them much credit to. We look at teaming as being something that's good for kids, but I will tell you it's also good for faculty. Um, to that end, we've been very successful with teachers understanding their time in and out of the building and how it affects one another, and they take care of each other. So, so far, we've been very fortunate with the number of absences and coverages that we've been able to manage. In addition, the district has provided us with some additional uh, building substitutes that have helped to offset those things. I think part of the, the, the difficult piece will be if we have larger teacher outages at any given time, 
uh, th then it will become difficult to cover. But right now, our teachers have been taking care of coverages because we have the flexibility in our ske schedule. I won't say to you that it's not sometimes a burden on those teachers because they're giving up a lot of that time and running from class to class and they often need to collaborate with their colleagues to, to, to plan for upcoming events, activities, and content. Um, and so to this point, we've been very fortunate and I give our teachers a ton of credit for the work that they're doing and for the support that they provide for each other. Um, and so as we look forward and towards moving into uh, this five day and, and having greater volumes of kids come into the building, uh, our substitute coverages may or may not change depending on how many teachers may have to go out for quarantine or, or any of those other unfortunate events. But to this point, we've been fairly fortunate. And just to add that, we've been very fortunate with the coverages because we've moved to the platform and use of Canvas at the middle level. And that's been a tremendous help in that um, there's always there's work for kids at any given time. When, when the teacher is out, kids know to go to Canvas and we can put the supports in those classrooms and they're still not, they're not, they're not falling behind as much as maybe in the past because the Canvas program teachers are utilizing and have come a long way with um, has been a great help to us this year. Um, as far as after school activities, um, it, it's a slow crawl right now. We, we're, trying, we're slowly moving to the point of offering a lot of different things. And there's, there's some unknowns to it yet because we, again, when we dismiss, for those who don't know, at 207, teachers still have responsibilities. And so clubs and activities and various things won't necessarily begin until maybe possibly at three o'clock time. So there's some things we're still kind of trying to iron out. There's been some virtual things occurring that have worked, that which may just continue in, in that vein to kind of keep it simple. But we're gonna to try to move back to, now that we're going back five days, that, that's where we move to. That's, our goal is to try to create normalcy and getting kids together in a safe way will help us with that. But again, there's some things we still need to kind of figure out and understand. Um, we have the basketball running right now, sports and cheerleaders, so we have a plan for that. But, it, but it's, a, it's a slow crawl and our, our goal is to try to, you know, if we're coming back to try to create that normalcy as best we can uh, for kids. The difficult part of what we face is if kids are expected to go home and then return, they need a ride. So if you're playing basketball, uh, and your day ends at 2.07 and your practice starts at 3 o'clock, you know, by the time you get home on the bus and then try to pitch a ride with either a classmate, or I'm sorry, a teammate or a parent, may be problematic. And so we're looking at creative ways of trying to, to move beyond that, perhaps keeping kids in location with coverages, allowing them to do their asynchronous work, um, if we're able to do that. With the basketball team, it's fairly simple. There's 15 boys on the team, we, the girls are finished, and now the boys are playing, and so those are small numbers. When we get into the spring and have basketball, assault, or baseball, softball, track team, where you have larger volumes of kids, it's gonna be difficult for us to try to navigate those types of coverages and keeping kids, um, or do we ask them to go home and then come back? And so the, those are the things we'll face as, the, as time rolls on. The, the, the needs of our unique student populations, um, some of our unique and uh, special needs classes, it, I will be, I'll be flat out honest with you, it is nice having them in the building every day of the week. Their, their programs are contained, their teachers are navigating and caring for them, uh, and they're just loads of fun to have there. It, 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 adds, it adds to our school culture. And, and so we've watched them grow into a five-day program, and we know that for that population that really needs it, it's working very well. Uh, and my hat's off to the, to the teachers in those classes and supporting those students and to the parents too. Um, it, for us, that's been a, a sort of a bright spot in a cloudy day. So are there any questions um, or discussion, Ms. McKee, for our two middle school principals? Thank you, thank you for that presentation. We'll start with the folks in the room. Questions, comments? I just, I don't know if it's necessarily a question for the principals because it may be more like district level, but um, directly and then also through board emails, there, there's a lot of questions about all of this. So I'm just wondering when the communications are going out to parents or so. There's a lot of unknowns, I guess, with the uh, how snacks are working and stuff because, you know, we keep getting emails, you're not going to let my kids eat all day. And so 
How is that communic what's the communication plan on that? Uh, communication, we actually talked about this as a cabinet this morning. So Susan O'Grady spent much of her day today uh, on exactly that. So great minds. Uh, so I anticipate that being able to be sent out tomorrow. So we'll do that as a standalone communication in the newsletter and also as a uh, posting on our website. Great, thank you. So I think that'll just dispel a lot of mm -hmm. questions. Oh, great, yeah, sure. Good. Yeah, Ms. Marcel. Thank you. Um, first, I just wanted to uh, thank both of you for providing me the opportunity to see your schools over the past few months, it was very helpful for me just to see in person, you know, what all the spaces looked like. So I just wanted to thank you both. Um, and I also wanted to note that I absolutely love the energy at the middle schools. And if I ever am having a bad day, I might ask if I can just come over for five <laughs> minutes to absorb some of the energy. Come over and do lunch duty. <laughs> <laughs> you do that once. <laughs> Um, and, and actually, speaking of, of lunches, um, I had a question um, for both of you because I know you were mentioning, you know, kind of how many students are going to fit in the cafeteria. And I just was wondering because I know when I saw it, it really helped me to visualize um, the capacities and how many students, when they're socially distanced, fit in the cafeterias. But if you could just maybe talk about, you know, how many fit in your cafeterias and then. Um, based on the attendance, kind of ballparking, like how full it is now, because I know at least when we visited Holland Middle recently, like it, it didn't look like there were a lot of seats that were open. And I, and I know some people have been trying to understand why, we want, why we're thinking about early dismissal, and I just think it might help them to understand, you know, what those numbers are, because unless you see it, you know, you don't really know how many students are actually in the spaces, and if you, went five days you know how that would change so if you wouldn't mind maybe just sharing that for the public and for the other board colleagues maybe that didn't see the that visual i think it's helpful i'll start and i'll let tim chime in because our school is somewhat different in that we have the the risers mm -hmm. and the learning stair and so when we first started to develop a plan for kids to come back um, at the beginning of the school year, we utilized all of those areas and calculated them into our cafeteria numbers, which is 147. So if you look at the cafeteria and you, and you count the number of desks, you're only going to see about 120 of them, but there's 147 spaces for kids in the extended portion of that. Um, we do have uh, our, our current largest lunch is 143 students, so if, if every student showed up, we have, we have a seat for all of them. Uh, we're running somewhere in the somewhere in the 65 to 80 percent range of population showing up, and so in that case, we're able to physically distance kids in the cafeteria. When we return, uh, before the latest numbers, we had 309 students in our large lunch, which would exceed that capacity, obviously about almost almost double. Uh, we can utilize other spaces for lunch, such as the auditorium, the, the the balconies, the seating that we have, um, and we will in the event that we would be asked to do that, uh, it, it would take additional planning. We can't use the gymnasium because it will be a space used for classes during some of those times, and so we can fit comfortably our current population. We couldn't fit the expected population in the cafeteria alone. We would need to find additional efficiencies in places like the other. No, I would agree that if, we're, if we were asked to, we could be creative enough to do something. Um, in a normal season, a normal school year, we have round tables where we can seat upwards of 300 kids in our cafeteria space. Because of the, the physical distancing, working with the six feet of distancing, we were able to put student desks in that environment. And we have about 120 seats in there. With the numbers that I, that I was looking at, um, we have roughly, um, we will be running roughly 200 to 210 kids per lunch, which overflows the space that we have available. So then to be creative, where would we go and how would we set it up? Um, we thought about, okay, we'll utilize the hallways. When you utilize hallways, now you're, you're drawing on more staff to put coverage. And now you're drawing on more staff for more areas to be cleaning. And it just creates, it gets more complicated. Again, not undoable, but it's, it's it's, it, it gets more complicated. So um, 
I think that and right now, that's, and that's kind of part of what the thinking that went into it. I'm not sure, did that answer what you're looking for? Um, could yeah, I think just to, to make sure that the public you know, had a chance to just hear a little bit more, because I really feel like when you see it, it helps you visually mm -hmm. to understand the dilemma. Um, and so, but sometimes when you just see a number, you're like, oh, well, they could just, you know, they could fit everyone in there. And um, obviously, uh, it's harder to get into our buildings these days. And so um, parents may not have the opportunity to actually see what it's like inside. Um, so thank you for that. And then I finally just wanted to, to thank you for the, the comment about creating normalcy, because I think that that is wonderful. It's nice to hear about the things that you guys are doing to help our students. And so I just wanted to thank you for all the work by your, you and your teams, you know, to bring that normalcy, which I think is really important for students. Thank you. Mr. Hidalgo. Thank you to both of you. I uh, appreciate the presentation. And uh, middle school is something that I thought, you know, was from what I'm seeing, that the lunch is, you know, the lunch space is probably even more um, of a challenge than the high schools, perhaps, for some periods. Um, so uh, I guess when you talked about in the morning when they um, are given a, a lunch and a breakfast, and that's the 15 minutes where they go into the auditorium, the gym, or the cafeteria, no, no? When they arrive in the morning, there's usually about a, depending on when our buses arrive, will house them. They, the buses are arriving around 7.45 a.m. And as they're entering the building, they'll be handed a lunch and their, and their breakfast in a bag, single bag. Mm -hmm. And they'll go into a space. They won't eat it at that time. They'll go into a space to wait for dismissal to go to their rooms. Um, so the, the bag, just, that's just an opportunity for us because if we get backed up, really what we're missing is the RA time. And we can kind of manage kids. We have a lot, a lot more duration, longer duration of time during that point in the morning to kind of manage the number of kids who want to get lunches. That's what you're asking? Yeah, well, I was going to ask the process because I'm thinking kids are going to get the food. I know I'm going to want to eat it, you know, well, right then and there. <laughs> yeah, that's a smart Yeah, job. that's likely to happen. Yeah. So that's okay. I mean, we have waste bins. You have ways of you're going to address it as it comes. I'm happy that we're providing the food. I think it's fantastic. Yeah, then the idea would be at, the, at that 11 o'clock-ish break time, they would then take their snacks out. If we couldn't socially distance, or I'm sorry, physically distance students in the classroom that they were sitting in at the time during that period three, we would um, carve off numbers of kids out of those rooms so that they could be at a six foot physical distance and utilize those other spaces throughout the building to take the overflow of students. So if in Mrs. Brooks's class, she had 22 students during that break, she would take seven or eight of those students, send them down to our current existing cafeteria or in one of those other large group meeting areas where students could could take the time to have their snack uh, and their break and still remain at that six foot physical distance. Okay. There'll be more waste bins, I'm guessing, around the schools. <laughs> uh, I don't know, but that, that's a side point. I apologize. But um, so I like the attitude that, you know, we'll make it work if we're asked to do it. And I appreciate that from both of you. Um, so what I would say is, I did hear from the elementary principals saying that, you know, they work with kids, they're back four days a week, uh, but, you know, if there's days they know that students won't be there, let your principal know type of thing, right? So I'm wondering, because we're looking about trying to control the numbers, if not now, but obviously uh, down the road, maybe a solution could be is asking the, the, the students whether or not they have those particular days. Let's just say the cohorts that they're in right now. Would they opt to do that if they were given the option? Then you would it help you to know that there's students that would 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 opt for that? And knowing that, let's just say if they're in cohort A or B, with alternating Wednesdays or or not, um, would it be helpful if you had that information and people were willing to do that as far as controlling the the number of students in school? I think it would be helpful. I think it's important for us to 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 be able to plan appropriately. I don't know that at the end of the day we would be able to readjust our classroom configurations and modify that on a daily basis to meet the, the physical distancing needs. In other words, when we know that there's a class of 27 students who are 
of the everyday school choice and the probability that they may show up, we need to provide that space for them. If we knew that they weren't coming on a Tuesday or a Thursday, it's not like we're going to break the room down in terms of its physical setup and then reestablish it for, for, for the other three days. And so helpful, yes. Um, consistent would be better. So helpful in the sense that the numbers are down, but being able to move the desks around is... Helpful in the sense that, that we know who is coming and who is not, so that the teachers can plan appropriately. Right. But from a logistics of desk space, which, which also made me think of, if the kids are going to be different and you, you have the set desks for the maximum, but maybe half are in there, uh, you can space them out, but maybe even... Uh, I don't know if moving the desks around into clusters that aren't being used and that, that have, that's been contemplated either, you know, but, you know. Yeah, we've thought of ways of trying to manage numbers of kids that drop below uh, a certain value that gives us the opportunity to physically distance students at six feet. And so whatever that number is and however a teacher can make it work, they will. But what we don't know is who's actually going to come and not come on those given days. And so the only thing we can plan for is the maximum. Okay, thank you. Great, Mr. Salmon, did you have anything? I'll be rather brief. Gentlemen, thank you for coming. Pleasure seeing both of you. Uh, Mr. Allern, thank you for the tour last week. Appreciate it. Uh, it, was, it was enlightening. The conversation was great. And I mentioned earlier uh, your comments regarding when some one of us asked about if kids have lost any educational time and you talked about them learning about patience and, and other things and attributes that will pay them dividends for years to come. Thank you for that comment. Um, going fifth, uh, some of my colleagues have already asked a question, but Mr. Long um, and to Dr. Frazier and, and to Mrs. O'Grady, that the conversation, the communication, when these kids go back, um, you know, Middle school kids can eat a ton of food in 15 minutes. They are ravenous. Uh, but that's what we're hearing from parents. What are my kids going to do? How are they going to make it through today? What are we going to do for them? So let's, you know, I, I appreciate it. I'm sure it's going to be done well. That's what we're hearing. Uh, so what that communication, getting out, getting into the community, making sure that their kids aren't going to be left behind when it comes to food. And I, and I agree that, you know, the club sense, how are we going to fill that void, that hour? Uh, is Chartwell's available to put another snack out of even for those kids if they stay behind at school? Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get through it. But uh, I'm glad we're thinking about it. I'm glad it's in the planning stage and we're, and we're moving forward. So thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Mr. Block? No, I appreciate the work that you guys have done. We've got a lot of kids coming back. We think everything works out. But uh, right now, I think thank you to you and your teams. So look, look forward to, to hearing how things go with the tracing. Um, having been the victim of a couple of quarantines that can take a lot of time away from school when uh, when the intent is to put kids in school, it's going to be interesting to see how, how that progresses. So that'd be something I'd be interested in hearing after the first few weeks is, is, is how many kids are actually missing, you know, a couple of weeks of school. Mrs. Brooks? No, I'm good now. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, Thank you oh, very much. And Dr. Thorbert, we'll start with you and then go to Mr. Byluck. Uh, questions or comments? Uh, you can hear me, right? Yes. Um, uh, just want to say thanks to these two principals. Um, the last two I had to send a note to because I forgot to thank them before they walked out. Um, thanks for uh, the visit last week. That was, that was very enlightening. Um, in terms of kids eating a lot of food in 15 minutes, it, it only gets worse in high school. I, I, I've seen six hamburgers consumed in 15 minutes. Uh, uh, good luck. I, I think this is going to work out well. Um, you know, keep us surprised. Um, I, I, I think this is, this is good for the kids, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Mr. Pilot. Mr. Mr. Key? Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to comment that uh, the, the information that was shared by Mr. Long and, and Mr. Holohan, and before that, the uh, two elementary principals, I, I think showed a, 
and demonstrate a lot of uh, creative thinking and just how thoughtful our administrators have been about finding solutions. So, I, you know, it, it gives us confidence that uh, we can give them the benefit of the doubt that they're going to figure out a way to address student needs. And they know what the needs of our students are better than we do, except, of course, for parents. But that's a whole other issue. Uh, and, and the last thing I'll say is I, I was really concerned about uh, not having lunch right off the bat because we all know how much food kids consume in middle school and high school at various stages of development. And, you know, the, the, the one other thing, I don't know if anybody addressed this, uh, but I trust that if a kid announces at the beginning of the last period that he's starving and he's got a box lunch and he wants to go eat it, the teacher's going to help him find a place to go have that lunch. Uh, so, I, you know... We find solutions and we can trust our administrators are going to figure out how to make this stuff work. And I'm continually impressed by this great work. So thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Tate. I didn't mean to overlook you. Uh, and now to Mr. Bilek. Yeah, I'll actually say, uh, I, I'm sorry, I texted a couple of you, but I'll just make my own comments. Um, yeah, I'm really impressed with the dedication and, and of course the information from these principals and and I agree with what Mr. Tate just said. I, I, I just know that the, our staff is going to be flexible to help these kids as much as possible and make this work. And, um, so I, I, I'll just say again, thank you. Uh, this dedication is really impressive. Uh, that's all. Thank you. And for myself, I'll just echo those words of thanks. Really very appreciative of all of the work that's gone into this. And again, thank you for the tour last week. I thoroughly enjoyed that. And uh, I really am. I'm very impressed with, you know, the, the task that you've been given and the, the way you've risen to that challenge. It, it's very encouraging, um, and, and we're so appreciative. Please share that with your staff. Thank you. Thanks, Chairman. Great job. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hallahan, Mr. Long, and give us just a minute to clean off the tables and make our switch to our next group. Supposed to clean my own desk. Dr. Sanko, do it for you. And last but not least, we have a uh, high school administration with us. So as I said earlier this evening, with us in the room, we have Mr. Al Funk, uh, principal of Council Rock South High School. We have Mr. Jason Truskevich, assistant principal at Council Rock North High School. And on the phone with us, we have Ms. Susan McCarthy, principal at Council Rock North High School. Um, so I'll turn it over to them to share with you. Thank you, Dr. Elliott. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the School Board of Directors. Appreciate your patience as uh, we kind of wrap things up with the high school level presentation and try to put a bow on things. We'll try not to uh, repeat some of the things that you heard from our elementary and middle level colleagues. However, we will try to reflect some of the nuances we see in grades 9 through 12. And I thank Mrs. McCarthy for joining us remotely, and it's a pleasure to have Mr. T with us as well. To state the obvious, there is no perfect teaching and learning platform in a pandemic. Our teachers are doing an extraordinary job of concurrent teaching. That is preparing in-person and virtual lessons, maintaining the Canvas modules, and grappling with live streaming instruction. Our students are working diligently, learning new technologies, maintaining their course of study despite lacking some of the perks associated with traditional high school. We do have a plan in place for February 1st and we intend to operationalize that plan. Of course, if we have learned nothing else over the last 10 months during this pandemic, 
we recognize the extreme importance of staying agile and flexible to adjust to whatever changes might be necessary. In terms of our planning for February 1st, we have been guided by two critical components. First, we are planning based on the registration numbers we started gathering back in November. And although it is obviously not realistic to expect 100% attendance starting February 1st, we must prepare the classrooms and large group areas for every student who has registered. Secondly, and more importantly, all of our planning is governed by making sure that the care, welfare, safety, and security of not only the staff, but obviously the students is first and forefront. So now I'm going to ask Susan to talk a little bit about our plans for feeding students. Mrs. Thank McCormick. you, Al. And thank you uh, to all of the members of our education committee for the opportunity to present this evening. I'm going to begin by highlighting some of the challenges that uh, we are facing as we attempt to feed our high school students um, each day one, once we begin the five-day learning option. As students enter the high schools each morning, they will have the opportunity to pick up a small breakfast or snack that they will then have the opportunity to eat at some point throughout the school day. Tables will be set up at the main lobby at Council Rock North to facilitate the delivery process. As you are aware, traditional lunch periods will no longer be offered because of our inability to provide six feet of social distancing while masks are off, as recommended by the Department of Health. In particular, at North, we have two lunches with an overflow of 130 students each after spreading students throughout all of our designated eating locations. In lieu of a lunch period, teachers will be providing a physically distant snack break in classes as feasible for particular classes. When this occurs, it's primarily dependent on the ability to again provide six feet of physical distance in particular classrooms as masks are removed to eat. We will be working with teachers and students to ensure a safe environment for this to occur at least one time during the school day for each student. And as Mr. Tate and Mr. Violet indicated, the flexibility of our teachers is going to be really important here. Um, as the day goes on, each teacher will need to determine exactly uh, which students may still be in need of a snack. Again, as students exit the high schools each afternoon, they will have the opportunity to pick up a bag lunch. Another consequence of our feeding practices will be an increase of trash, both within and outside of the schools, increasing the workload of ABM custodial services, in addition to the sanitation of each classroom uh, that will have to occur each evening. Alan, is there anything that you'd like to add to the feeding of students at South that would be um, in addition to what I've just said? Yes, thank you. Uh, in, in terms of feeding students at South, we also uh, do not currently have the cafeteria capacity to feed all of the students registered for a five-day in person with their masks off while maintaining six feet of physical distance. This is the case even with the satellite cafeteria which we have created in our gymnasium which currently houses ninth and 10th grade students in our hybrid model. Three out of our five student lunches would be over capacity. Collectively, we would be over capacity by about 250 students or seats. We will be distributing our breakfast slash snack and lunches in much the same manner that Mrs. McCarthy described. Uh, I will talk a little bit about our arrival and departure, which may differ slightly from our sister school. And I think Mr. Hidalgo uh, referred to this earlier. In the mornings, students start to arrive on campus about 6.45, 6.50 rather early. As you know, the contractual day for teachers does not start until 7.25. 
we house the students in three main areas. It's basically our three main entrances. The uh, auditorium link in the auditorium, cafeteria, and then the gymnasium link. And those areas are supervised and we ensure that they are also physically distanced. Uh, at about 7.20, we start to allow the students to head upstairs to the second floor. And by that time, the teachers have prepared the classrooms and are ready to receive those students. So that's, that's a little bit about what happens in the morning. So I don't think the distribution of snacks should be an issue uh, at South with that kind of morning protocol. Um, basically, the lunch in the afternoon will simply be the reverse of that. Students will be picking up their bagged lunches uh, in those three areas on the way out to the buses or to the student cars. So and that's how we'll do that. During the hybrid, we have dismiss the 11th and 12th grade students it's not a, a terribly big deal at 2 10 p.m and then the 9th and 10th grade students at 2 15. so we are considering february 1st kind of continuing with that staggered dismissal uh, albeit at different times it would be 1 10 and 1 15 p.m so that's a little bit about the arrival and departure at council rock high school south i'll let Mrs. McCarthy speak to the nuances of Council Rock North and of course I'm well aware that she is dealing with some student parking challenges that uh, I don't have at Council Rock South. Mrs. McCarthy. So, so up to this point Council Rock North has encouraged students to go directly to class in order to avert the overcrowding on the first floor. We've been able to do this with monitors supervising them on each floor. At this point regarding parking, the, the Council Rock North parking lot is able to accommodate the projected number of junior and senior drivers. However, depending on what occurs fourth marking period, we may yet have a need to utilize St. Andrew's lot. And now Al is going to move on to physical distancing. Okay, thank you. So Dr. Senko mentioned the registration numbers of each school earlier in the evening. And based on these numbers, we have at South, based on the current registration, 44 classes, which would be at 19 or more students. For these potentially larger classes, we will be designating certain large group areas for the classes to possibly relocate. This move from the classroom to the large group area would obviously promote physical distancing. The large group areas we wish to capitalize on include the two auditorium lecture rooms, up to three classes in the cafeteria proper, two classes can relocate to the gymnasium cafeteria, and one larger class could be reassigned to the library. So essentially, each period, and we have a six instructional period day, would have seven or eight large areas available. We will still need to maintain at least one or two large areas for purposes of Middle Bucks Institute of Technology overflow students and for those classes that are uncovered without substitutes. So I know that that has been a much talked about topic here at the board. And just to give you a sense, last week, uh, we experienced the following. We had seven unfilled teachers on Monday, uh, three on Tuesday, 12 on Wednesday, 10 on Thursday, and four on Friday. So essentially, if a class is uncovered, uh, we need to redirect them to a large group area, and typically a teacher assistant or a hall monitor would then monitor the, that class while, while the students took the class asynchronously. Okay. In terms of contact tracing, which now has been renamed case investigation. I just want to talk a little bit about the nuances of that and how things may change come February 1st. We have been fortunate during the hybrid model in that when we have had to conduct case investigation or contact tracing, which I think Dr. Sanko explained well, essentially if there is an infected student or it could be a staff member for that matter, on campus during the contagion period, the contagion period being defined as the 48-hour window prior to the onset of symptoms, then we go back 
and we contact trace all of those classes that the individual participated in. So what we're trying to ascertain is whether any individuals were within six feet of the COVID infected person for more than 15 minutes. And if that is the case, these individuals are reported to the Bucks County Department of Health as close contacts. Because we have been able to adhere to the six feet of physical distancing, we have had relatively few reports of close contacts. Of our 100 plus cases, I believe at this point, we have only had to report six close contacts. Obviously, if we increase the number of students in a classroom and thereby reduce the likelihood of maintaining that six feet of distance, we are likely to have more close contacts when tracing infected individuals. In other words, it is possible that a student, if a student is infected, the student seated in front, the student in back, the student to the left, the right, possibly the diagonals could be reported as close contacts. So again, when you extrapolate that over the course of a six period day, there is the possibility, and it's a worst case scenario, that for one infected individual or one case, we could be reporting as many as 30, 35 close contacts. Susan will now speak a little bit about the many variables that we have seen that have impacted student attendance during the hybrid and potentially will continue to impact students as we move to five day. Susan. Thank you. Up to now, it has been very difficult to predict what student attendance will be on a given day, thus making it equally difficult to make decisions both at the classroom level and at the administrative level. Some of the variables impacting attendance include the number of COVID cases in the community, the number of COVID cases in the school, the predicted COVID surges, how many students who are actually in attendance throughout the day, as well as the typical variables affecting the attendance of high school students, of, of which day of the week it is. Is, is it a Friday or a Monday, uh, days before holidays, uh, the weather, test days, et cetera. One of the particular challenges of ensuring that we meet uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Education required instructional time for high school students with the shortening of the school day to uh, 115 has been how to navigate the resulting half hour of asynchronous time. What we have landed on is that each teacher of a full year course will assign one asynchronous assignment per week of approximately 30 minutes in length with teachers of alternate day courses doing the same for 15 minutes. All assignments will be placed on Canvas at the beginning of each week. Al will now um, end our presentation with some other considerations. Thank you, Susan. So some matters that we continue to discuss and plan for include the resuming of in-person extracurricular activities, we have over 70 clubs at South, and I believe North has a similar number. And some clubs are more conducive to virtual meetings, while others thrive on being conducted in person. These clubs also vary quite considerably in size, ranging anywhere from two or three participants to well over 250 plus participants. Mr. Raddick, our activities principal, and his counterpart at North, Mr. Griesbaum, are working with club advisors to develop plans and schedules for each of these groups. Also, we are finalizing plans for our Middle Bucks Institute of Technology population. MBIT is continuing with a hybrid format, so we are working to make sure that our students can continue uninterrupted with their programs and have spaces within our buildings to complete virtual work when MBIT is not in session. And finally, we are making adjustments for our low incidence special needs population to ensure that their dietary and lunch needs are met during the course of every academic day. So again, we stand ready 
to operationalize our schools for the five day in person and as stated earlier we will remain open to any changes or modifications that may need to occur most especially in the areas of staff and student health and safety thank you very much for your attention thank you very much for that presentation we're going to start with folks in the room questions comments mr block thank you mr mckee thank you gentlemen and Ms. mccarthy for that you guys have unique challenges at the secondary school um, I, I live some of those every day specific to attendance uh, two questions for you number one and, and dr fraser you might actually steal this one but the the case investigations present some interesting implications potentially and you know our intent is to get more kids back in the buildings we do know that there's a population of kids that won't come in you know because of that but just you know i i, I want to keep an eye on kids that are quarantined and where we're not and i said the same thing to the middle school principals putting kids out of school because of these close contacts when the, when the true intends to get them back in so as we get into this be interested in your uh, perspectives i i'm interested in the extra workload you know the the the, the county was doing this work. this is where i said dr Frazier, you might want to jump in the county was doing this work before they haven't been able to keep up this is now a significant portion of work and my question is are we able to do it effectively um if we're doing it all does it cost us more money because it requires more people or are people devoting resources to case investigations where that time is better spent or should be spent on something more specific to the kids in the building so i'll <laughs> i'll start this and then i'm sure uh, mm -hmm. these gentlemen and uh mrs mccarthy will want to jump in as well about the uh, real lived experiences at the building level the answer is yes to everything that you just asked um it is definitely costing money it's costing human resources it's costing time it's taking folks away from uh you know what their typical job is um in no small parts in really substantial ways um many many hours um in a typical day in fact pretty much every day and yeah i mean it's it, and it certainly isn't uh the fault of the county health department i think any health department in the state and probably in the country has run into the same thing yeah. you just get to a certain point where you're oversaturated and you just don't have the personnel to be able to do what you had been doing and so uh certainly that happened here in bucks county as well and so um i would estimate i didn't have to look back at my notes but probably a month ago six weeks ago um it got to the point in the county where when it came to the school work that was being done we were always doing the case investigations and then the health department was doing you know the actual contact tracing um so when it comes to the school folks um four weeks ago five weeks ago six weeks ago somewhere in the neighborhood basically it just became the case investigation process so whatever we um, have been reporting to the bucks county department of health in terms of hey here are the folks students uh teachers support staff administrators whomever it is have been within six feet for 15 sustained minutes here are those names then those folks have been quarantined by uh by the department of health um so so that work has really for the past month month and a half fallen um completely on us which which in large part it was um already what is what's going to happen now um and mr funk articulated this just in terms of the proximity that we're going to see certainly in in many more of our classrooms than what we have been but the other piece that dr sanko went through earlier is is really every bit as impactful here and that's the piece that you know, when, when we get a report so we get a report from the department of health every day with a line list um, is what they call it so so we find out um, from the health department positive cases as well as close contacts who's been quarantined and then so sometimes we already knew those folks and some names are new to us but the first thing that we do is look at that onset date so it's either hey when did your symptom start what's your symptom onset date or it was the date of your positive test in most cases it's the symptom onset date and that's what caused you then to get a test but not in all cases 
Um, so, uh, and as Mr. Funk said, then you look back over those trailing 48 hours. So not, right now, the situation that we've been in, and Dr. Black, Dr. Casey Black is the one who's been spearheading this with some help, but um, you know, she would take a look at it and say, okay, so based upon the onset date, here were the two days that this student would have been infectious. Um, good news, those were cohort A days, and this is a cohort B student. So literally, in that situation, zero case investigation would be done. Mr. Funk doesn't have to do anything. Mr. Truskevich doesn't have to do anything. Mrs. McCarthy, Dr. Black, like no one has to do anything with those cases. So now where we had either a two out of, out of a seven chance or a three out of seven, now, I mean, unless your 48 hours were Saturday and Sunday or Friday evening through Sunday evening, you're, and if you've been attending school five days, you're going to have been in school uh, while you were infectious. So that's a really substantial piece of this that's going to impact uh, just the volume of case investigations that we have to do. And then you couple it with what Mr. Funk was going through and Dr. Sanko did earlier in terms of, okay, do we have four, do we have six, do we have eight, how many, you know, depending on how many kids are in that classroom um, or adults. Um, so again, going back to cabinet this morning, we talked about benchmarking all of this. So we'll be ready to do that in 10 days, um, both from a positivity standpoint and from a quarantine number standpoint. Um, so we'll understand what the trends have been and uh, start collecting that data um, as we have been starting on February 1st and you know, see, what the, see how that data comes back. But quarantining um, a number of students is, is a definite concern of ours because we don't want to be in the business of over quarantining. That's for sure. Um, that's sort of you know, antithetical to what we're trying to accomplish here by bringing students back to your point. And then the other concern is the time that it takes for our school administrators, our nurses, uh, in particular, Dr. Black, uh, Dr. Lambert, Ms. Adamas, um, all these folks who are doing case investigations on weeknights, on Friday nights, on Saturdays, on Sundays, um, literally this past Thanksgiving day. Um, I mean, just do, the case investigation process is, has already been a 24-7. Um, I don't know at this point if we're going to need to devote additional resources. We'll find out once we get into it. But we have folks who are already um, quite stretched. Right, right. So just from my perspective, that's the answer I anticipated. If it's taking away from educating the kids, keeping kids safe in the classrooms, you know, we've appropriated funding for COVID mitigation. Um, personally, for me speaking, I would love to see creative ideas around spending that money to alleviate the street. You're still going to have to do it. But if there's a more creative way to do it, I think this board, and again, I can only speak for me, would be open to ways to take that burden off the staff who have other things to do so we make sure we don't miss those. And, and also, um, in line with how the board can support you, are there any other major hurdles that you foresee going back to five days that this board can help you mitigate or help you find a solution to that, that's not already being worked on? I mean, I think the board has been very generous in helping us out with some staffing issues mm -hmm. um, that are related uh, to the pandemic. Um, you know, I, I think uh, off the top of my head, I, 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 I don't know if I could give you anything concrete that we would necessarily seek out. Um, I, I think I would emphasize what I, I believe I mentioned in my remarks and that is just the ability to continue uh, to be agile and flexible that if we do need to pivot for whatever the reason that we, we have the ability to do so um, but I, I think no I think it's been most appreciative uh, you know by, by our staff uh, administratively and the teachers the support that we have received thus far. Yeah, I agree with Mr. Funk I mean the support the creativity um, putting things into place for the what ifs, uh, especially with staffing and substitutes. I mean, it's important to have people in those buildings. And I appreciate you thanking you know, for the opportunity of thinking about contact tracing or investigating because it is a time consuming task. And for those who have done it, I mean, it is, you identify the student, if they're contagious, you're looking at the attendance records of each class the student was president, president pulling out seating charts, identifying where the students sat, who were present, 
going in, measuring desks six feet, contact an administrative assistant to send out letters to the students who were present in the classroom, as well as contacting a newer number of people about being a close contact. So, you know, if numbers do go up, I think both buildings have been very lucky, knock on wood, uh, since winter break. Uh, I know we had a couple of cases during break that had to be investigated, um, but hopefully that continues, that we don't have any, but that is a concern that, you know, if the number of cases does increase and it's brought into the building, a larger number of students within that six foot, they're out from seven to 10 days, yep. you know, unless they get the test. So I appreciate that offer. Yep. And then the, I guess the last thing I'd leave you with is one of the things that is a concern are those kids who were comfortable and happy in the hybrid who are now going all virtual. And, and how do we make sure that they don't take a step back, that they don't um, uh, suffer as, as a result of that? So as we get into this, I'm sure you and your teachers are thinking about how to, 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 to be aware of what's going on there. And as we go into the hybrid, that might be something else um, that would be interested, uh, would be interesting to hear about, uh, and, and hopefully we're able to uh, to deal with that. Yeah, I think our teachers have continued to refine their practice, right. teaching across multiple platforms. <laughs> you know, having you know the in-person students, and then the live streaming, and working with Canvas, and doing everything they need to update Home Access Center. Uh, they really have done a remarkable job. <coughs> And I, and I think they'll continue to do so. Yeah, they have. I've seen it firsthand. I wish you guys luck. And uh, certainly, Ms. McCarthy and uh, gentlemen, thank you uh, for, for everything you've done to get ready. And more importantly, thank you for what you're going to have to do when the day comes. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. McKee. Other questions or comments? I, I have no questions. I just want to express my very sincere gratitude for all your hard work. And um, it, it, it is mind-boggling as the board gets the, the deck in advance. And when I started thinking about the number of contacts and seeing that grid and all of that, I mean, that's crazy stuff. So I wish you all very good health. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for everything. Mrs. Marcel. Thank you. Um, I wanted to first just thank you for, I know you mentioned uh, staying agile and flexible and I know that you've been doing that for a very long time and so just thank you for continuing that and um, going forward just keeping you know the student's interest just front and center I you can tell by being in both buildings that that's exactly what you're focused on so just thank you for that um, I had a question a few questions one is um, and I don't know if Dr. Frazier if you want to chime in or not but um, you were talking about the the investigations that you would have to do um, once the, the students are you know less than six feet how that is going to expand but aren't there very low attendance numbers right now um, in terms of so going forward if the trend stays with low attendance does that mean that there'll be still work to do but just that that workload maybe stays a little bit more consistent with maybe what you're seeing now maybe a little higher I'm just trying to yeah and again, that. I can take the first part of that anyway <clears throat> the workload will will still increase just by virtue of the five days in school as opposed to two or three days so again the first thing when when we get that line list and, and we see that name or or we've already known about that name is okay what was that onset date and what are the two days before and as Mr. T said, you know, at that point we're looking, okay, is this a cohort uh, hybrid student? Is this a virtual student? Okay, it's a hybrid student, what cohort? Okay, this cohort, you know, so either the opposite days, okay, boom, don't even need to, to worry about it. And then if it was uh, that student's days, uh, one, or, one or both of their days, then we're checking attendance to see if the student was in. And if the student was in one or two of those days, then, um, then that's where the work really begins um, in in detail and you know part part of the difficulty of this just functionally logistically is we don't get that line list until mid to late afternoon typically it's three o'clock hour when that comes in and so you know we have our our school administrators and we have our nurses who now need to do that work because you know we, we need to do that work before the start of school the next day um, and so it's pulling the seating charts and you're looking at the 
okay, all those students who was in school, who wasn't in school. So, so the whole second piece of it, if, if we do have low attendance, like we've had a lot of low attendance at the high school level, then yeah, it's gonna ease a bunch of that. But just by virtue of that student, you know, the, the positive student being in school, it's still gonna trigger the whole first set of that. You know, okay, what, what days was a student here? Um, and, and, you know, again, the answer is likely to be yes. So now we're checking attendance. We're looking at, and we're still going to have to pull those seating charts. Still might have to make some phone calls to teachers um, who might be gone, you know, for the work day. Um, so, so without a doubt, there's going to be an increased workload. But if our attendance rates at the high school level continue to be where they have been, and we are able to social distance, then it won't be nearly at the high school, probably than what we'll see at the middle level, where we've been seeing increased levels of attendance. So I think it's, it's somewhere in between. Okay, thank you. I don't know if you guys have any other. No, I, I think we explained thoughts. it well. I mean, I think the, the work up front doesn't necessarily change. If you have an infected individual and they were on campus, uh, you know, within that 48 hour window from the onset of symptoms, you have to do your contact tracing. Mm -hmm. So the work has to be done. Yeah. The difference will be, a, a, as you stated, mm -hmm. if you have lower enrollment, your chances of close contacts, which are then reported to the Department of Health and then go on quarantine, uh, are reduced mm -hmm. with low enrollment. The higher the enrollment, the closer students might be to that infected individual when you do your case investigation uh, that so it's the, the result would be different potentially thank you very much yep. thank um, you. I, sorry. Um, I also had a question uh, I know it's probably hard to to even answer or forecast this but do you think there that just in your opinion obviously just it's not based on anything you because you're projecting forward um, if there are any factors that you think may affect attendance in the future you know let's say we do go five days and you know maybe after a certain point people see that it's going okay you know maybe more people come or maybe um there's something else we're not thinking of in terms of something that might affect attendance you know if we start requiring students to have their screens on you know do you think that might make some students maybe want to come back in person like i'm just it's really just pure opinion um, just if there's anything that you know you guys are getting a sense yeah. of I, I mean obviously anything that we can think of to try to incentivize attendance and, and promote attendance we, you know we, we've been grappling with that but I think as Susan mentioned in her remarks there are just so many variables mm -hmm. that impact that and whether it's raining out whether there's an assessment that day uh, whether a teenager might be manipulating their parents I know that's been known to happen once or twice <laughs> um, so it, it's just difficult um, to project you know, what attendance will be. Um, I do think sometimes, you, you know, we had, we had the shoulder seasons kind of the, the week or two before the winter break, the week or two after winter break that I think people were very leery of. I know that they, they communicated that uh, to my office. Um, I also think that this February 1st date was, was out there that maybe people said, well, at this point, let's wait and then, then we'll engage. So I, I think those are some factors that may have contributed to, you know, what was admittedly very low attendance uh, at the high schools. Uh, when we first started September 29th um, with the hybrid, uh, there, were, there were good numbers. And then, then we saw kind of a, a steady decline. It's hard to say, you know, why that was. It's, it's hard to identify specific things to attribute that to. Um, I think there were multiple factors. And, and of course, that's the rub, right? Because we all want the students back. You know, there's no denying that. But as you bring more students back onto campus, then you increase, you know, your potential for some health and safety issues. So it's, it's a very difficult uh, balance to strike, especially when you're not in control of the variables. And I agree with Al and what Susan said 100%. You know, I speak with the C I'm a senior class principal. I speak with the seniors, and it's a mix. You know, a number of students are switching to virtual because they anticipate more students in the building. I had students switching to virtual because their friends weren't in the building. But then you speak to one now, they're coming back to five days because their friend's coming back, and I get an email, am I able to return the five day? Then I receive four additional emails from their friends. I want to come back now because of my friends. I mean, you brought up the camera piece. I think the camera piece is more for just student engagement and teachers being able to recognize the student understanding. Um, 
as we're all well aware, it's able to determine a student gets something or not, that with itness, that, that term we've used for decades. You can see that. That's missing. Um, so I, I always encourage kids, if you can get back in the building, you feel comfortable, get back in the building, because that's going to increase your student learning. But again, as Al said, increasing the numbers, then raising that factors with safety as well. So it, that balance is difficult to... We have... Go ahead, Susan. Go ahead, Mrs. McCarthy, if you're ready. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. We have a phenomena at the high school level, especially among our underclass students, that when uh, they have an activity coming up like a dance, they, uh, they sort of all wait each other out to see who may or may not be attending. And, and honestly, in, in some cases, in many cases, we wind up having to cancel that dance because they've waited each other out too long. And I was reminded of that phenomena as, as we watch our students who are, are supposed to be coming in hybrid, but who, um, you know, see that, that their friends are coming in or they expect their friends not to be in or they expect not to have students in class, so they opt to stay home waiting to see if that changes. But I, but I think they're all opting to do that. And, and then we have this situation that we have with low attendance. So I would, you know, urge the community to, uh, if you're interested in, in our five-day uh, in-person uh, option, and, and that is what you signed up for, to give it a chance uh, that your students should attend. And I think they'll see that if everyone is attending, uh, the classes will be fuller and, and we'll have, you know, that, that um, the, the ambiance that, that they're looking for in a classroom with, with a number of students and their teachers. Thank you. Um, and then I just had one final comment. Uh, I know that MBIT was mentioned, which I appreciate. And I know that a number of parents have reached out being confused about how the early dismissal and lunches and things are, are going to work. And I know Dr. Senko put together some information for me to share with parents that I've been sharing as well. Um, Dr. Frazier, is that also included in Ms. O'Grady's information, I hope? It's it's not. Uh, that communication is a communication for all secondary parents. Um, so it's really focused on the um, so maybe dismissal like piece. Something and maybe just for MBIT parents? Yeah, I think we can do that. Yeah, we can we'll, probably we'll, do have, that. we'll have individual black okay. from each of the schools. Thank you. Right. Yeah. 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 Thank you very that. much. Yeah. I really appreciate that. Communication out tomorrow. We'll send follow-ups to our communities next week. Okay, with okay. thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hidalgo. Thank you, Mrs. McKee. Um, Thank you, Mrs. McCarthy and gentlemen, for being here so late. Um, it's, it's late for a teacher and a principal, I know that. Um, so I'm going to leave my, there's a lot that we talked about regarding the health and safety plan regarding quarantine and um, contact tracing and now case investigations, which I'm reading about. Um, but so I'm going to try to hold that off because you, uh, it's more of a district-wide issue, but specific to what you guys were saying, the one question I just had briefly was, uh, I think you mentioned there's three, Mr. Falk, there was three um, um, lunches that were over capacity at the full attendance we're expecting with the new registration, and 200 o students over. That's cumulative over the three? Collectively, yes. Two, uh, 250 over, yes. Are, are we using any of the hallways like they're doing at the elementary school, or is that feasible? Yeah, I, I, I don't see that as feasible at the high school level simply because we have classes going on and, and the distraction. I, I think there's a number of things that would be problematic. Distractions for instruction, uh, the cleanliness issue, the supervision issue. Um, I know, was it a couple years back when we talked about unit lunch, we, we talked about actually a lunch that was actually more across the building, but that was with tabletops and it was more uh, you know, appropriate furniture and things of that nature. I, okay. I, I would be reluctant to have students in the hallways eating. Well, thank you. I, I just because people are, I mentioned it, people are thinking, and, and yeah, when we talk about the rock block, that's what made yes. me yes. really think about that. And if you have anything to add. No, I agree, and that's the yeah. thing with the, you know, the unit lunch, which we were considering. We were still looking at designated areas for these students to be eating. They were going to be in the cafeteria and the commons, which are our two food centers currently as well as making those adjustments on the first floor on the east and west side to put the additional tables in for students to be able to actually seat. And we would have the, you know, 
our crew come in and be able to clean those particular areas. You know, looking at north with the hallways, um, our outer, so you think of north being figure eights on top of each other, our outer hallways are only six and a half feet wide. Oh, yeah. So you would be literally having one person stack all the way down the hallway, which is also where the classes are taking place. Our inner hallways are eight and a half feet. Even still, it's, yet yeah, they could be facing each other or staggered, but again, there's academic classes going on at that time, and our two largest lunches were approximately 130 students over on our fourth lunch and our sixth lunch. So these students would be scattered all over the place. Mm -hmm. Six feet in the area between the auditorium and the cafeteria, no. we'd only be able to fit 40 people. So we're still, you know, we're still shy dozens of spots for these kids to be able to eat appropriately. Yeah, I thought so, because North is pretty narrow. Um, corridors there around the cafeteria and the gymnasium. So I was thinking more along the south side as a solution. The North is definitely more, uh, um, um, you know, tough to figure out. So I'm sorry, to, to, to my could, rest of, sorry, Mr. I'm sorry, I just, <clears throat> if I could just um, illustrate a comparison for you. When Mrs. Crawford and Mr. Smith talk, talked about the overflow at our 10 elementary schools where we do have desks in the hallway, we're looking at a minimum of five, a maximum of 12, <clears throat> which is a, a far cry different than what Jason and Al are talking about, 132 or, or 200 and some. So sure. I just want to make sure that you and the public understand that it's a, it's a different look at the elementary than at the secondary. Yep, it's all Thanks. relative. Okay, that, that's really key too, thank you. Um, I, as I said, the rest of my questions are not high school specific. I don't want to hold you guys up here all night if we get into a deep discussion, so. I will uh, end it there for now. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Salmon. Yeah, I'm very brief. Uh, gentlemen, Mr. McCarthy on the phone, thank you for the presentation this evening. Uh, Al, specifically, thank you for the tour last week. The coffee was delicious. Um, it, it, was, it was enlightening. I've said this earlier in the evening. To walk through that school um, and also be in that school when it's you know pre-COVID in fall. Um, my senior last year didn't have a senior year. I'd like to see the seniors have a senior year this year. We've pushed back Disney. Uh, I'm sure, you know, plans and everything is going to be here before we know it. Um, I'd like to see that, and if we can do it safely, effectively. Um, quick question. Have we ever considered per diem nurses, bringing them in to help out with cases? I'm sorry. It just it popped in my head. I don't, I don't know the answer. To that, and that's fine. Um, we can I, talk I, about it later. Yeah, I, I do know that we brought, we have brought nurses in um, for different purposes at different times on an ad hoc basis. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know in this particular instance. Yeah, so I could talk about it. I just, it yeah. just popped in my head thinking about case investigations. That's kind of like their world that they live in, right? As a nurse. Yeah. Um, so, so you know, what, one example, one thing that we're doing right now is we had a nurse who was out on leave and um, for some legitimate uh, health reasons, and uh, we've actually brought her back just to help us mm -hmm. with the case investigation process. Yeah. Um, but again, that's one of our, that's right. one of our employees. Yeah. 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 yeah, good use of an employee, too. It's great. Mm -hmm. Again, thank you. I wish you all the luck. I said earlier, you guys are writing the history books for the next chapter at Council Rock. Um, we're here to support you. Uh, please don't be shy, um, and I wish you well. And let's get the kids back and step back safely and effectively for, for, for the good of the order. Thank you, ma'am. Um, going to folks on the phone, beginning with Dr. Thalbert, questions or comments? Uh, no, just thank you. Um, again, thanks for the tour. It was uh, eye opening. Um, I, I, I think, I, Al and, and I think, and Susan, I'd like to revisit this in a couple of weeks after we re reopen because. If, if your current attendance stays where it is now, you're going to have room you don't know what to do with. So, um, but I, I agree with you, you have to uh, plan for the max. I just don't think you're going to see it. Um, so, thank you for coming. Thanks for your flexibility. Thank, thanks for the, the, the get it done attitude. I appreciate it and look forward to hearing you tell us how successful you were in a couple of weeks. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tate, any questions or comments? Ms. McKee, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. I just want to say thank you to our principals. And um, I wanted to throw in a little plea to parents. Um, I think a big part of making this thing work well when we go back to five days is that um, kids behave responsibly.
responsibly in school and, and outside of school. And we can reduce community spread by, um, you know, kids are social animals. I realize that, teenagers. But, um, you know, we've got to be responsible in terms of conduct outside of school. And I, I hope, and I trust that kids are, uh, for the most part, doing that. And um, we also have to be responsible in terms of mask wearing, hand washing, and social distancing and other behavior because uh, we can all play a role in, in minimizing community spread and, and making this five-day thing work. Uh, so thanks again, everybody, for your presentations tonight and your information. Thank you, Mr. Tate. And Mr. Bilek, anything from you? Yeah, thanks. And uh, thanks, thanks again for the information, everybody, and uh, the, the work you're putting into this. Um, did I did I hear you right that we are using uh, the gymnasiums for lunch or we're not? So at, at South we use one third our gym, we basically have three gymnasiums, but uh, we are using one third of the entire space. So it's really one entire gymnasium. We're devoting that currently to the ninth and tenth grade. Uh, as it's a cafeteria, so um, that typically is a PE teaching station, um, but we are using it now um, as a cafeteria, which is a little bit, uh, I guess, what Mr. Hidalgo was talking about in terms of being able to capitalize on any available space. Uh, but we do want to make sure that we maintain some large areas come February 1st because we feel that we may be utilizing them, whether it's because we have uncovered classes or we have larger classes that we need to relocate. Does that help? Yes, thank you. What about North? We're not utilizing the gymnasium for lunches, just for our physical education classes. So is that something you're considering? No, we have not considered that because we've been using that for our gym stations, for our classes. Uh, we've been using our cafeteria and our commons. And outside, but then once the weather changed, they've been forced inside. Also, I want to add that South Gymnasium is quite a bit larger than North. Yes. Yeah, I understood. I understand that. I, I'm just wondering if it would make sense to uh, take a look at that. Uh, how many gym classes, you know, phys ed classes are we holding right now? Or what do, what do you think you're going to be doing for the remainder of the year for phys ed? Currently at North, I think some of the activities are pickleball, badminton, uh, volleyball, I believe, as well as ping pong. Um, and they're utilizing, you know, think about that for the first gym, it's just utilized for volleyball set up. Another gym set up for pickleball, and the third gym is set up for badminton. So even just having three stations, just say there's 60 kids, those three stations are being utilized. So that would take up our whole gymnasium. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, my turn to go. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Bilek. Um, I also want to express my appreciation for all the work that's gone into this. I uh, truly appreciate your efforts and those of your staff, and please communicate that to them. Um, Mr. Funk, you had said, you know, we're not in control of all the variables, and obviously you are juggling so many factors to bring this together and make it work. And I just want to echo the comments of Mr. Tate. You absolutely hit on the first thing I thought of, in that uh, we need to appeal to our community and to our families to follow the recommendations uh, in order to mitigate this virus and its spread and for us to stay healthy and for us to stay safe. So in addition to all of the work that you and we collectively are doing, our community, our families have a very important role to play in this as well and I would like to appeal to them to continue to do so. Uh, any final comments tonight? Just, uh, I'd like to uh, throw it to Mrs. Taylor because I think she has some additional information, <laughs> Mr. Uh, Selman, relative to the question that you asked. Mrs. Taylor? Okay, thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes. yes. Okay, I wanted to just circle back to the question regarding perhaps onboarding additional nurses or the use of per diem nurses. We, we do have a pool of per diem nurses that we work with regularly. We have enough to cover our daily absences and sometimes we do have a shortfall even in that regard. 
Uh, nurses are hard to find in the per diem capacity within the schools, and now more than ever, nurses are at a pretty big shortage. So I just wanted to add that. Hope it's helpful. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hidalgo. I uh, just wanted to say, um, you know, it doesn't go unnoticed to Dr. Frazier and your cabinet for getting us to this point and getting elementary students back in in that plan going so well and getting us this far to secondary. I just wanted to make sure that I let you know we appreciate that amazing leadership. On behalf that, of the thank team, you. thank you. Thanks, Mr. Hidalgo. Further questions, comments? No? I would just like to announce our next meeting will be on February 25th for the Education Committee. If there are no further questions or comments, then we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone.